All right, good morning again. Um, we're going to uh, convene the board meeting of the Texas State Technical College Board of Regents. Uh, first thing we're going to do is have an invocation from Jonathan Hoekstra. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you so much for the opportunity to, to serve Texas, uh, serve our students, uh, serve our employees in this way, Lord. Uh, we just pray as we uh, gather that uh, you pour an extra measure of wisdom on this group and uh, that we can uh, represent you and our taxpayers well. Lord, it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so I've got uh, two ways to call the meeting to order. <laughs> so, I don't know, somebody else is going to have to get their own big one. But. Good thing I didn't do that, right? Make it loud. Uh, all right. Meeting of the Texas State Technical College Board of Regents is called to order this Thursday, November 16, 2017, at 11.02 a.m. Uh, let us have a determination of quorum, please. Ivan Adarsa present. Joe Hart. Keith Honey present, we do have a quorum. Um, at this time, I'd like to uh, welcome the new regents to the board. Uh, we're certainly pleased to have you with us and looking forward to your participation and uh, getting to know you better and looking forward to your input uh, on the board uh, to make this a better organization, a better system. I'd like to give you each a few moments to just uh, tell us a little bit about yourselves, if you would. And, sort of what your hopes and dreams are and kind of where you've come from and such. So, uh, Tony, do you want to start? blessed. My wife and I have three great kids. Uh, they all graduated from Waco Iron State. Uh, and uh, uh, it's been an interesting life, uh, just being able to, uh, I look forward to, to being in this position, being able to uh, engage each and every one of you, uh, make uh, TSCC better. Uh, I was really admiring the regents have, that have uh, retired here that, that we recognized last night. Uh, on all the things that they've done and they've seen, witnessed, and I look forward to, to seeing how TCC can better equip the workforce of, of tomorrow. You know, generate that middle class that we're all looking for. Mm -hmm. Generate that, that revenue, gener make Texas better, uh, uh, and make McLean County, or oh, all of Texas really, uh, better for each and every one of us. I look forward to working with uh, all of, all of y'all, and uh, uh, thank you so much. Alex? <clears throat> yes, my name is Alex Mead, CEO of the Mission Economic Development Corporation. That is my day job. Uh, I'm definitely excited to be here. I've uh, My background is kind of all over the place. I've worked in the utility business. I've uh, worked in Washington, D.C. as a consultant for a large consulting firm. I've worked in Austin. Um, but over the last about 12 years, I've been in economic development. And uh, it's something that I truly do enjoy. Um, you know, it, it took me maybe about half of those years or a little bit more to truly appreciate the importance of workforce uh, in the state of Texas, especially as it relates to what I do. Um, <clears throat> a few years ago, about five years ago, we recruited a company out of Michigan. We were competing against Alabama. We, um, the company was a, a, a large manufacturer of autom automotive parts. <clears throat> the company was going to invest $50 million in the city of Mission and hire about 400 people. And, and usually we would focus more on the incentives that we would offer these companies to make sure that they were here. Um, so when we finalize the incentives, the president of the company tells me, the incentives are great, appreciate everything you're doing, but what are you going to do about my bench? And so when he told me that, I said, well, I'll introduce you to the local college, I'll introduce you to the ISD and all these folks. And he says, Alex, you're not listening to my question. What are you going to do about my bench? All you're doing is setting up meetings. You're technically not doing anything. 
And, and, and really that kind of hit home because in, he was correct in the fact that I, as an economic development person, was not doing anything. And that was when I really started paying so much attention as to the importance of workforce development. And I think what TSTC is doing is, uh, is leading that uh, effort for the state of Texas. And so I'm really excited to be part of this board. And I really uh, think that, uh, that this just aligns so perfectly with what I do. Thank you. I'm Curtis Cleveland. I'm from Waco. I grew up here. Tony, I graduated from Waco ISD. Uh, <clears throat> but we discovered earlier Alex and I have a common uh, background. I was in economic development from 1985 to 1995. And I have been on this campus uh, talking about technical training since 1985. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> so I've worked with a lot of every chancellor since 1985. I'm tremendously excited about what's going on now at TSTC. And <clears throat> thank you for your leadership, Mike. Uh, I've been fortunate enough the last 12 or 13 years to work with the TSTC Foundation. Um, that's been a great experience and, and we've watched this growth. <clears throat> I put food on my table in the structural steel business and <clears throat> we need welders. And that's why I'm also uh, passionate about technical training. And here in Waco, we, we have an initiative community-wide to lift people out of poverty. <clears throat> and I think that we are the organization that can do that for the state of Texas by giving every student for sure, or every young adult, the opportunity to have a technical skill. And uh, <clears throat> I'm very excited to be a part of this. Great, thank you all for your comments. I think uh, I think we're all excited to have you on board and you bring a new and fresh perspective and different backgrounds to the board. And so I'd really encourage your active participation in the board, I'm sure you will, but I'd just say that's uh, definitely something we'd encourage and hope you will do. And uh, if ever, you know, any questions or thoughts or wonder what to do or not to do, you've got a, a great wealth of experience also sitting around this table. So feel free to talk to any one of them as well if you need any guidance. So thanks and welcome aboard. Uh, in kind of in light of that whole thing, as people make presentations today uh, to the board, since we have three new <coughs> regents, if you would just be sure you kind of put your presentations in some context of maybe the historical significance of why we're talking about certain issues or what some of the background might be behind some of these issues. Uh, I think it would help them kind of uh, get up to speed a little quicker. So we may take a little more time today to do that, but I'd encourage that to happen so that they can put things in the proper perspective and context, if you would. Um, and finally, uh, Mike, I'm going to direct you and challenge you to put together an orientation program for the new regents, if you would, and uh, please deliver that, if you would, in collaboration with the board as necessary. I think yes, any sir. of us would be more than happy to participate however you feel and see uh, fit for us to do that. So hopefully that will happen in the near future. Um, and <clears throat> I think all of us have been through some form or fashion of that orientation. I will tell you it's very valuable. It's like uh, the old saying, drinking from a fire hose, but um, it gets you the foundation to start the, start the process on, and I would expect that it, it'll, uh, it'll be very useful to you in kind of setting the overall, getting you an, an opportunity to ask a lot of questions and also get a lot of information about what's happening at TSTC and what some of the history and processes are. So I guess you'll get that underway. Mike. Yes, sir, we will. All right, very good. Any other comments uh, before we launch into the meeting proper? If not, uh, we have the agenda before us. Uh, I have one amendment to the agenda. Um, the item eight, which is shown on the agenda, is TSTC Foundation Operating Plan uh, by Jeff Kilgore. Uh, we're going to incorporate that instead of it being a separate item eight we're going to incorporate that into item seven the chancellor's comments and uh, the chancellor will uh, uh, take uh, the opportunity to introduce that subject for yes, sir. us so uh, that's one amendment to the agenda are there any other amendments to the agenda hearing none uh, with that amendment do i have a motion to adopt the amended uh, 
the amended agenda. So moved. We've got a motion by Regent Hatchell. Second. Second by Regent Hearn. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Uh, next item is approval of the minutes from the August 8th and 10th, 2017 meetings. Uh, hopefully you've had a chance to review those minutes. Um, do I have a motion for approval? Motion by Regent Gorecki. Do I have a second? A second by Regent Abad. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, recognition of guests. Do you have any guests with us today? I think so. All right. Mr. Chancellor, your comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. Settle in. Uh, I'll only take 90 minutes. If I could um, allow me to call your attention to a few things that we handed out to you. The uh, presentation I'm about to give you is in PDF form printed here if you want to see it or, or refer to it later. And this is the sort of practice we'll do for a while as you all, particularly for new members, uh, get, get the context of all the motion that's going on at TSTC with a bit of historical perspective. And in that light, we've also provided you the report that we published a year ago on TSTC. This, we have come, this is our biennial report to the legislature. It's not required. We do it because they really appreciate knowing what's going on, what's up to date. And so we thought you'd um, uh, really like this. I will tell you the real eye-opener for a lot of the members this year was this on the front cover, the Get a Job or Get a Refund program, which had been launched a year ago uh, now. So far, we haven't given a single refund. Um, and uh, th that really raised some eyebrows uh, on the dais and in private meetings. But then the other thing I would call your attention to is look at page 10. If you wonder if paying an agency for results will have an impact on its behavior, look at this chart. And what you'll see is, is that we've grown, and, and by the way, this chart didn't have the benefit of the 2016 numbers, which if they had been on here, we have grown student results 77% since 2010 when the new formula began. And what that is, is the number of students we put to work and then the salaries they earn. So uh, if you wonder if an agency can respond to a change, to moving its cheese, the answer is yes. And it's right here. So you'll enjoy reading the rest of this along with the budget books that you got from CFO Hoekstra and then a, the mountain of other material we'll give you. In a minute, I'm going to call your attention to this, the new Vitality Scorecard. But let me lay some groundwork before we get there. First, I'll say welcome. I'll parrot the chairman's comments and let you know that um, we kind of have a game plan to help new members. And it'll include things like the chairman just uh, charged us with. We'll spend a bit more time in meetings over the next year. And then once you get acclimated, we'll get more streamlined uh, because we respect your time. Uh, we'll provide handouts when we can. Uh, we will uh, do a formal orientation day. We'll, we'll try to make a habit of sending a bit more information to you in between meetings so that you can absorb it at a, at, at a pace that's not as, as bad as drinking from a fire hose. Although we're going to subject you to that, I promise. Um, there is a, a required training program at the end of this month. I think all three of you have acknowledged that you'll be there. Um, the, uh, Michael Bettersworth, our Vice Chancellor, and I are each presenters at that conference. I've gotten to where I can't get out of it. They grab me every year. And, uh, but Michael uh, uh, has presented before, but will be on a new topic this year. So that'll be really good. Um, in order for you to vote on a budget for TSTC, state law is, says you have to attend this conference. Attending in person is a smart idea. 
Because if you don't, you're going to have to watch the videos. And, and you don't want to do that. And, and then finally, uh, we, are, we are actively updating our Regent Handbook. We give you a resource book that's a little bigger than this. And it's got our bylaws and a bit of our history and then our various practices and how we do things and all of that. And we found over the years that's helpful of, as a reference book. So you can just have it on the shelf and if you have a quick question you can refer to it. So we expect to have that done about uh, February or March. Um, so, welcome. be in perpetual evolution, if not revolution, for the next 20 years. And as Jack Welch said once, when the rate of change outside a company exceeds the rate of change inside the company, the end is near. And so if we don't move at a pace that's equal to the rapid changes in the economy we're in today, then our end could be near. And we take it that seriously. So we'll be in inflection periods from now on. You will hear me every quarter talk about how we're continuing to press forward with the next chapter. So I'm going to kind of put it in, in a big picture. In order to do that, we'll have to step back in time a little bit. And we lost our regents who, last night, who were actually here in those days. But about 10 years ago, TSTC look like this. This is your classic bureaucracy. We were compartmentalized. There was no delegated authority. Everybody was a, was a tiny cog in a big machine. Each risk was treated as though it was a total deal breaker and therefore no expense was spared managing risks down to zero. There was no nimbleness. It was a classic bureaucracy, but that's normal. We're a state agency, we're a college, that's the way it had been done for decades. We weren't unusual, but what we knew was it wasn't right for tomorrow. It wasn't going to let us be the nimble uh, co uh, college we needed to become. So what we decided to do was operate like a business. Now that's easy to say, but I assure you it's really hard to do. You guys run your own businesses, you know, and you know the difference between when you go down to get your driver's license versus a nimble business. We have a bureaucracy in one hand and, on the, and, and a business on the other. Well, these are actual, I went back and pulled these slides. These are, these are slides from presentations made to the Board of Regents in 2007, 2008, and 2009. And you can see, here's where we were talking about. We've got to move from this stuck in the mud old notion of what, what it means to be a college into a nimble, market-driven, um, entrepreneurial, hungry startup kind of mode. So here we are 10 years later. I will tell you, if you were to measure where we were then, where we are now, it'd be dizzying the amount of change that's occurred. But actually, we're a long way from complete. And I'm going to show you some stuff today that indicates we're, going to take, we're about to take another lurch forward. Okay, here's what happened right after these slides were done. Here's what happened. We took a look at ourselves and we said, not only are we all bound up in all this bureaucracy, but we are functionally, we're structured wrong. We had four vertically integrated silos. Some were this big. Others were this big. 
and they were wholly focused simply on their backyard. Sachs rules said they had to be completely independent. In fact, Sachs rules were so cumbersome that if this silo had a program and that, that group over there needed it, we had to go through a six month paperwork process in order to get that moved over there. And the co-board had to say yes, the Sachs people had to say it was horrible. And then on the top we had a thin and not particularly effective kind of system office at the top. Uh, and so our structure well, when we ask ourselves, is this the way a business would operate, it was real easy. Well, of course a business wouldn't operate like this. This is, a, this is a model created when you do your books with quill pens. And when the long distance costs five bucks a minute, that's the, how you would create a business like that. And so we looked at these two comparatives. We want to behave more like a business and we are functionally structured wrong and we were confronted with this dilemma. Well, do we take these five functionals, try to convert each one of them to a business kind of mindset and operating practices, and then merge them together? Or do we do it the other way around? First we merge them together, and then we begin to focus on converting that whole into a business practice. Well, the, the decision actually turned out to be fairly easy, and here's why. What we had learned was that those four, the independence enjoyed by those four meant that we really literally had four distinct businesses that couldn't, that really uh, were similar in name only. We all had the same name, but the operating practices, the way we did our accounting, the way we did our human resources, the way we did our, do you know we had five IT groups? Five. So um, all of that couldn't have been more different. And so what we realized is if we try the business approach first, all we'll end up with is now five different business approaches and then we'll have to merge those. So let's merge the devil that we know and then we'll turn our attention to business once we're a whole. So in 2013, the board approved the concept, and it took us, by the way, that amount of time, it took us two or three years just to get the management team to the place where they understood what it would mean to merge our colleges and then become more business and nimble-like. Those, the, the herding of the cats, if you will, together into a common vision took years for us to get there. So we, once we saw the vision, we brought it to the board in 13 and said, hey, we've got a great idea. We think we can really prepare ourselves for the future if we do this, and y'all concurred. Took us two years to get it, three years to get it done. And the, one, of the, one of the things that I love to brag about is when we were done with our SACS consolidation and the visiting team came to Texas to test us, and this is like, an ISO 9000 audit is what it feels like. These guys walked away with zero recommendations. That is an extraordinary, we've been told since, nobody does that. What that told you was that the coming together had a literal impact on the culture of the whole college, is that we could take these heretofore wayward operating units and bring them together in such a way that we could show unity that way. So that was a big deal. Here we are merged. We're still fixing some of the bureaucratic stuff. Jonathan has constant headaches in terms of bringing together five different accounting groups into one purchasing practices, things like that. Uh, he's got uh, issues with that every day. Elton has issues every day in terms of making sure we're on the same page and we're doing things the way that we need to do. But they're minor compared to what it is we have to do going forward. For us, and, and by the way, 10 years ago when we said, what does it mean to operate like a business? We didn't spend a lot of time defining that. What we said was nimble, or even worse, 
whatever a bureaucracy isn't, that's what we want to be. And, and so I think it's really important that we actually define what do you mean when you say you want to operate like a business. So from this point forward, from this inflection point going forward, here are some of our guiding notions that are going to drive the TSTC we build for tomorrow. And they start with capital. Well, we are in a capitalist society. That's the whole idea of entrepreneurialism in America is capital is the blood that drives the firm or the bloodstream that allows the firm to drive. But the really important part is not money or capital. It's that every time we spend a taxpayer's nickel, we're going to expect a yield. That's the way a businessman thinks. What's our yield for the nickel we're going to spend? That's very different than a bureaucracy where they spend a lot of money on compliance and security. We can't possibly make a mistake. On the capitalist side, though, a calculated risk is where you find your yields. That's why you're in business. And so we're, that mindset is underway, that shift. Budgeting. A budget without a plan is useless, and a plan without a budget never gets done. So we're in a situation now where Jonathan is leading our, our corporate-wide effort to shift budgeting from the old notion of here's your piece, here's your piece, and here's your piece, into a strategic investment exercise. How is it we're going to invest in various opportunities within our firm and what is it that we expect back out of those? That is a wholly different thing than TSTC has done for 50 years. Um, that means we'll strategically prioritize things. You have to. We'll end up with way more good ideas than we can possibly do. So part of the exercise that management will do with you through budgeting in the years ahead will be, here's all the possibilities we had, and here's the unique blend that we suggest we invest in in order to realize our mission and get the right return. And when I say return, I don't always mean fiscal. You know, I mean mission accomplished return. Okay. Um, the other thing and we decided in our strategic plan last year for the first time ever is we have got to do a better job of focusing on revenue generation and then eliminating or minimizing all the rest. This is a defining characteristic between a bureaucracy and a, and a, uh, a, a business is business will not spend a nickel on a backroom function unless it's absolutely essential and that that nickel gets, it, it is optimized for the control you're trying to impart. Bureaucracies, on the other hand, will spend $10 to protect a nickel. And so we're in the midst of that kind of shift. Customer focused, of course. Um, create sustainable competitive advantages. You know what? This sector is going to get turned on its head in the next 20 years. And there's going to be winners and there's going to be losers. And what we choose is to create a college that has competitive advantages that mean it endures and it's a winner. That it's still here 20 years from now doing that workforce mission that we have. And we'll spend some time on this next one. Data and analytics. Managerial accounting. This is my favorite topic in grad school. I love managerial accounting. Don't you? <laughs> I, often called cost accounting. I love it. And um, I've got two kids with BBAs, and they would call me constantly because they hated the cost accounting, but I love it. And the reason is, is it's really at the heart of how it is you run your business to meet your mission. We had virtually no managerial accounting up until recently. Jonathan has been, and his team with Bell Whedon and others, have been steadfastly building our capacity in terms of cost accounting because we can't possibly realize all those other things without it. 
In the past, the data we measured had to do with, are we complying with the rules? The data we measured was, uh, what are the numbers we have to send to the co-board? But it didn't have anything to do with effectiveness, efficiencies, and whether we're actually realizing our mission and what areas of our business were the most valuable to us. And so we've got that going. Uh, manage risk in a cost-effective manner. I've already talked about that. Bureaucracy spend a, you know, 10 bucks on a nickel and it just drives me crazy. Um, delegate authority to talented, this is huge. The thing about bureaucracies is no one person ever holds risk by themselves. Risk is always spread among committees or groups. Risk is held by a process or a body of rules. But if you don't give someone authority to get something accomplished and pick a talented person who can go make it done, you'll never become a business. You have to give them the authority, ensure they have the tools, provide all the support they need to get their job done, and then hold them accountable for the results. That's what it means to operate like a business, and that's the transformation that TSTC is going through. And then, of course, alignment. Alignment, the opposite of alignment is chaos. So we aren't going to get there. So let me call your attention to this document. Take a second, look it over. Oh, wait a minute. I got ahead of myself. I'll tell you about this in a second. Let's go to this document. Oops. So look at it. This is our brand new Vitality Scorecard. This one happens to be for diesel uh, uh, equipment technology. You can see there's three pages, there's various things. We're going to go through each one of these so I can show you exactly what they mean. But the reason why I wanted to show you this is, this is an exemplar of the pivot that's going on right now. Last meeting, I sh we showed you this. Do you remember this? We spent 30 minutes on this. You guys lit up when we showed you this because you saw the amazing potential of beginning to examine ourselves this way. And as you recall, this was a two variable scatter plot with wages of our graduates on one axis and contribution margin of a uh, department on the other. Generally speaking, the further to the northeast you get on this, the more vibrant and valuable you are as a program. Well, so this new one you have is that two-axis scatter plot on steroids. And I'm about to walk you through it. But before we do, I want to make sure we've got our terms straight. Enrollment. Now, I'm going to talk in business terms. Never forget that our product are real people. So, and we respect that. But we'll talk for just a minute in terms as, as though it's widgets instead. But these are real people, and we, we respect that. Enrollment, the number of customers we happen to be serving at a particular point in time. How many, how many customers do we have? Now understand, that's not what your revenues, nor is it how many unit sales do you have. It's a number of customers. Semester credit hours is a measure of product units. So you could have one headcount by 20 semester credit hours, or you can have them by three. And those are two completely different customers for you. And then contribution margin. You all know what that is. That's like profit margin, except it's for an internal operating division. Now, I suspect you could search far and wide across Texas and the rest of America, and you're not going to find a college talking about net contribution margin in the boardroom. I doubt they even do it in the back room. But if you're going to operate like a business, net contribution margin is essential. So as we go through this, check it out. 
In this new one at the top of the page, you're going to find kind of a summary. Every program we have at the top of this page, I have taken, we're going to break down these boxes with this next few slides. So at the very top is a big summary. Remember, these are actual data for diesel. We have an overall composite vitality score. Why is that important? Well, it's important for two reasons. Comparative. Diesel can look at itself and compare itself to IT or to automotive or to uh, linemen or whatever. It can also be longitudinal. Over time, diesel can say, I'm moving the needle on my composite score. Because if they are, they're getting stronger. Then there's two particularly important data points. Graduates, uh, the range of salaries that our graduates are making. Remember in our funding formula, our graduates are measured for five years. So here's the average salary of year one. Here's the average salary of year five. Over time, this can be really, really helpful for a program leader to know what are my entry salaries, but how, how fast are they maturing? You can infer quality here. If this is higher, then you know they're probably higher quality. But if it was plateaued, what it might mean is they're getting in the door, but they're not progressing. What's going on here? So you've got some great inferences from data like that. Net contribution margin. Boy, who likes diesel? Hoo-wee. That's pretty nice. Then we've got the unduplicate. Here's your, this is your uh, number of customers. And then the semester, here's the units sold, product units sold to this number of customers. Over time, what we hope is these data and the other that you're about to see are going to allow our programmatic leaders to operate their line of business in an ever increasing, more impactful way. That they can become essentially um, product managers within an industry sector where they can really begin to move the needle by serving the employment needs of the employers out there. And generally that's how you us what is the profitability of this unit for each unit of the operating unit for each product unit sold in other words what's your profit per unit sale you'd measure that in your you measure that in your business everybody measures that in their business so naturally we want them to know that too it's a factor they can try to grow and so there's a lot of inferences that can be made out of this. Percent of grads found working. How many of you cope with stale inventory? If you have stale inventory, you aren't going to sell everything you make. It's not going to happen. Well, naturally, what your ideal is, you sell 100% of everything you make. If we do that, we'll have 100% right here on this number. Diesel has 87, that's pretty dang good. College-wide, we have 80% as the average. And um, we probably are the best in Texas at this in terms of the folks found working. Now, by the way, that can be impacted by this. If they go out of state, they won't be showing in this numbers because these are the actual found working in the Texas Workforce Commission database. If they started their own business, they won't be in here because the UI database doesn't capture them. So numbers this high, although you've heard us say our placement rate's 90 plus percent, generally it is, but this, is, this has got people that have fallen out of it because we're measuring found working from a different source than the co-board would. Our numbers with the co-board would be higher. 
We use these data because these are what drive the funding formula. You want the company aligned with the funding formula, not with the co-board, which doesn't pay. So, persistence. Although we're really a B2B business that provides strategically trained talent to employers, we are also a B2C in that we provide personal enrichment services. And when people come to us for that personal enrichment service, it takes a while. If they leave us before they're done, then the persistent rate goes down. In other words, persistence is the inverse of dropout rate. So in this case, you can see the, the folks who go to diesel now, do you understand that in two-year colleges in Texas, the dropout rate is about 70 or 80 percent in the two-year sector? So if you have a persistence rate above about 30, 40, 50 percent, you are extraordinary. You can see this program right here, once they get their hands on a student, that student's going to finish, get to, get to work. So that's pretty dang cool. Um, Yes, wrong button. Enroll, this is, you know, are we growing the number of customers that we have? And by the way, we have to really point this out. When, in, in every other college and university in Texas, they're paid for seat time. Therefore, enrollment is incredibly important to them because the more heads they have, the more money they make. So their expenses and their revenues are tied inextricably to enrollment. So the most common question I get when I run into a legislator or anybody who doesn't understand exactly how we work, they'll ask me, how many customers you got? Meaning, what's your enrollment? Now, would you ask a car dealer, how many customers you got? Would you even care? How about... How's sales? How's revenues? How many units did you sell last year? I mean, there's a lot of other questions that are way more important than how many customers you got. So with us, we will always measure this and we will always report it to you. But in addition to this number, we're going to show you other numbers that probably are more germane to whether we're being successful. And here's one reason why uh, it's important. If you have a process where you're putting raw material in, in the pipeline, and then you're moving them through the pipeline, and then you're spitting them out the other end of the pipeline, you've got three variables that are going to control this number. How many did you put in? How many did you keep? And then how many did you spit out the back end? Win margin over the past three years. What business wouldn't like that kind of change? So uh, here's some more data you see at the bottom of it. This is by campus. We get to show, you know, regionally how we're doing in the various ones. And then contribution margin by items, meaning are we seeing it through tuition or auxiliary income? What kind of different buckets are we seeing the overall revenues coming in on, on all of this? This data, it, we aren't going to show this to you every single, you, you wouldn't, with the, you know, 100 plus programs we have, you'd never have time to do anything else. But we'll show you this kind of stuff aggregated. The value of these data are not you, with all due respect. The value of this is to our incredibly talented people who are running these programs and the faculty that make this happen. They now have a new report card or scorecard, if you will, that they've never had before. They were flying the plane with no instruments. And the only thing that really mattered was, how many customers do I have in the pipeline and how much money are you going to give me for my budget? Those were the two variables we operated on for 52 years. Now for the first time, we're going to give these business guys who happen to be educators the ability to see where they are in the airspace. 
They know their altitude. They know their airspeed. They know whether they're going up or going down. They know how fast they're going. And they also clearly understand what the goal is. And I believe we're going to see a new era of entrepreneurial zeal pop out from people who came to education from industry in the first place. I can't overstate how this changes everything. We are starting with this fall and this report, we have now become a new company. Because our whole team can see itself with new eyes. So we didn't just roll it out. If you remember the big picture I showed you that I flashed through that had a bunch of people in the room? Right out here in the Houston room, more than once, we have started collecting our managers from across the state and beginning to introduce them to these tools and to procedures they can use to help be better managers of their particular line of business. It's having a, we, the first one we, we took our three wigs and we showed them the three wigs and they actually took wig one and said, you know, we like wig one, we can realize that, but if you'll tweak the metric just a little bit, we'll actually be in a situation where we can realize better results for you. So we did. So we used input from the line managers who are going to make all this happen to tweak our college-wide uh, objectives so that they were achievable for them. These are dynamics that have never occurred at this school before. So although what you see might be boring data, the real story here is the cultural and operational difference that these data represent we're turning into that business-like organization that will have the nimbleness and responsiveness and the ability to build a competitive, sustainable competitive advantage that the others can't. Uh, number of customers, how about this? This is a, you could almost, let, let's do business on this. Here's your inventory, here's your units sold. You could say that. Or you could say, here's your, this is work in process. This is completed units sitting on the shelf. Because until they're placed, they're just a unit on the shelf. And these kind of dynamics will begin to permeate, sink in and permeate. And, and folks will naturally respond with the behaviors that are going to optimize them on this chart. So, graduate wages, this is more longitudinal stuff where we're, we're able to show the business leaders, you know, how they're doing over time. Uh, just as important as a data point at any particular, region Andarza, you said it once, one year does not a trend make. And so, uh, in this situation, uh, this is, we'll be able to show them, you're trending up, you're trending down, and of course, uh, how the conversations occur then are going to be really rich and are going to really define who we are. If someone isn't trending in a right direction, the right kind of conversation sounds kind of like this. Gee, Joe, couldn't help but notice, you know, you, you, you had a soft year or you had a soft couple years. What could we do to help you with this? How is it we could turn your number around? Are there constraints in what we're doing that are making it tough for you to get it going? Are there environmental issues we need to help with? It's a completely different conversation between administration and the line managers who run their business line when you have data like this to be able to show them. So, to operate like a business, it's about investment. It's about planning your activities and making it right. We have to prioritize. Growth is essential. There is virtually an unlimited demand for our product. There should be no reason why we can't continue to grow the units sold and the number of Texans placed. Because I'll also say I think we're a bit nimbler and ahead of the competition. So growth is eliminating and optimizing backroom stuff. You've already seen us do a whole bunch of that. 
We opened three new, you guys don't know this, we've opened three new campuses in the past three years, and we actually shrunk our overall headcount with three brand new campuses. And the way we did that was we uh, optimized or eliminated backroom functions that didn't provide revenues to the firm that were just drag in accounting terms. And then we redeployed that capacity to the new functions we needed at new locations. That sounds like the way a business would operate. So all of these things are going to be kind of guiding principles for us as we go forward. And virtually everything you see us bring you for the next year or two is going to be uh, based on the fact that we're intentionally moving toward these kinds of concepts in building a new culture of entrepreneurial nimbleness and one in which we take the talented people that we have and man we have some amazing talented people and we unlock their potential by giving them the authority and the control of what it is they're running and then we provide them with accountability. Now accountability is a good thing because what accountability is you get what you deserve so if you do well, you get what you deserve. And if you stumble, then, like the family we are, we say, okay, how can we make this better? But we expect performance. So all of this will be the guiding principles of how we go forward. Any questions or comments before I change? The same way we measure everybody else. Oh, well, that's because that that's because diesel is not in Hutto. Yeah, you almost almost had me there. <laughs> uh, what, what? <laughs> Diesel's not in Hutto. This is strictly a diesel scorecard. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> how do we continue to develop our new programs, looking into the future of what's ahead and how do we get uh, prepared for the next big thing to happen in the workplace and what's the process to get those programs on this chart um, and are some, of, or are some of these programs that you could specifically relate to those kind of programs that may, that may be you know below on contribution margin right now but we expect them over mm -hmm. the next several years to be over here in the northeast quadrant somewhere. Okay, that was five questions. Okay. <laughs> you remember them all. Yeah, okay. The first one, from a regionality standpoint, let me offer you this. Uh, Elton has, has been reworking the instructional division, and we now have, for the first time ever, for example, uh, for the first time in our history, all diesel has one boss, no matter where it is, in, the, in this state. All instrumentation, one boss. All lasers, one boss. All IT, one boss. And that boss has statewide accountability. And so in the year and two ahead, as we go through the planning, planning processes, we'll be challenging them with questions like, are you in the right locations? Are there, uh, should you, should, should diesel, we'll be challenging the diesel guy. Should you be in Hutto? It's, it shouldn't be our question to answer. They're the, one, they're the business line. They're the ones who are going to know, yes, I have employers that I could serve out of Hutto in a really good way, and then that launches the strategic decision about how are we going to prioritize and then deploy our capital in the hierarchical investment plan that we make. What will be our next programs? So when it comes to incumbent programs, it's the people we already have who will make those decisions, along with administration. The next big thing, the next big thing, tent, it, what's happened recently is next big things in technology tend to be mashups of existing technologies. That things come together in a new, unique way that creates a capacity that wasn't there before. Now, if you think, well, what does that mean? Well, what it means is things like 
when G the GPS technology, when it first came out, all GPS had to do with was, where am I on Earth? But when GPS met big data, what you suddenly had was the ability to do demographics on a geographic plane in a way that you never did before. So we had this separate technology, GPS over here, we had big data over here, and when they came together, there were GIS capabilities, there were commercial things having to do with marketing and sales, there was that sort of stuff. When web came together with big data, what we got was the fact that Amazon knows every move you make. And they use that for commercial advantage in terms of how they stream their information to you and so forth. So we're constantly on the lookout for indicators that things are coming. And the ones that are kind of got our interest right now are augmented reality, because we're starting to see a bit of, of uh, quivering, let's call it, uh, in terms of augmented reality and virtual reality, those two things, with applications in two areas. Where will it be applied in the, on the shop floor and how do we need to be ready for that? But the other is, how will we employ those technologies to teach? Because that's going to be giant. When it, and if you want, I, I can tell by the look, maybe what I ought to do is I'll send you all some YouTube videos that will demonstrate to you what it looks like when you use augmented or virtual reality in training situations, and it'll blow your mind. So those are examples, and we're keeping a close eye on that. And then what we do is we'll pick programmatic leaders and we'll say things like, hey, do you, what do you think of this? Is there some ways we could work together to try to encourage you to experiment around with this and maybe be ahead of the curve on it? So those are some examples of how we do it. Of course, we also, in our new markets, and then on an ongoing basis, we study what the workforce trends are in the various markets. You know we've had Ray Perryman do a study for us down in, in uh, Fort Bend. We had one out in Abilene, uh, other places that uh, don't come to mind off the top of my head, but we also study those workforce data. And then finally, none of that matters if the employers aren't going to be using the technology. So we have an incredibly robust, ongoing conversation with the employers in our region and it's about to get deeper still as Michael's tool gets deployed across America. Um, and so uh, that kind of knowing what's coming will be far easier for us because of all of that. But the, you know what, if from time to time, for example, we train technologies that are actually too cutting edge and the, uh, and the employers tell us, oh, we're not using that version yet. We're still way back over here. Do you, are you, have you experienced stuff like that? We're, st we're still way back over here. And so my point in that example is what we really need to focus on is, is not merely that new cool stuff, but what are the employers actually demanding in the, in, on the shop floor? And as long as we're aligned with that, we'll be in good shape. My, Chancellor, could that I add kind of? to the end of that question? We're also, uh, through Regent Hearn's encouragement last meeting, we're developing our own employer feedback uh, tool. Okay. So we'll be able to use that directly from employers ourselves to align our curriculum in the directions that we're going. Chancellor, uh, also uh, getting back, drone technology is a good example. When you look at, as the Chancellor said, it's a combination of several programs that we already offer to bring them together to add specific skill sets to add on or, or manipulate for the students. So there's, as, as far as watching, we're constant, as he said, we're constantly watching, but right now we're, we're being able to, able to pull from existing technologies to develop like drone technology because it, it encompasses so many programs that we already offer. It's just a matter of pulling those skills together and, and packaging them uh, together for the students. Uh, if I could, let me go, go ahead, Alice. Uh, let me ask you a question. If I'm reading this right, the zero line on this chart, everything to the left of that line is your money loser. Is that correct? Yeah, um, theoretically, yeah, from a contribution margin, yes. Well, can I speak to that? It, it is yeah. from a current 
revenue and current contribution margin perspective. So what is not factored in that is the anticipated returns from the appropriations. So we will, for many of those that where the wage exceeded minimum wage, there will be a return, but it's a long-term revenue gain. And so uh, from the finance perspective, we give more credit to current revenues and current returns. And so that, that is measuring basically tuition revenues less current operating expenses. Well, then my question is, uh, how long, how long do you give it to stay on that side before you seriously consider eliminating it? It, it depends. So, and taking those resources yeah. and putting them here. So, so um, the analogy I've used before is this. Suppose you're a football team and suddenly we change the rules on you and, and no longer are we going to count your success by how many points you put on the scoreboard. Instead, what we're going to do is say, all the other rules stay the same, but now all we care about are first downs. The more first downs, the guy with the most first downs wins. In that situation, it would take you a while to kind of get your rhythm in terms of how it is. I'm going to play the game for first downs as opposed to the old metrics. And so my point in this is, There'll be, there'll be both data-driven and intuitive kinds of reviews with this, but I think we owe it to the guys who have gotten a scorecard for the first time ever. I think we owe it to them uh, that they get a chance to try to move their needle before we overreact to the first version of the new scorecard. And so those conversations, uh, I can't tell you, here's how we'll make those final decisions right now. What I can say is we're probably not going to be hacking off programs right away. Instead, we're going to see what are the steps we can do to help people get better and see how all of those respond. So we'll do a bit of trial and error in the first year or two as we try to get going there. And um, now, with that said, if there, there are programs that have environmental factors that are beyond their control, and they're in a spiral down that isn't likely to recover, then we'll make tough decisions on ones like that. But we won't wait forever, but, but I don't think it's right to change the rules and then instantly start lopping heads off until we give people a chance to, to see what can happen out of it. Well, again, my, my answer is we don't know yet. We just handed them this for the first time, okay. like in the past month. Okay. Yeah, here, here it is for the first time. Here's your scorecard. Yeah. Regent Skinner, though. Um, We've, yeah, turf, turf grass has already been mothballed. Yeah, that's, that's one of the programs that left. Okay, all right. <laughs> Okay, let me say it one more time. This changes everything. I don't know of a college out there that's operating with this kind of resolution and this kind of business approach. And I think it's going to make a giant difference. Now let me say one more thing about this and the competition. This is the good news. The first is this. Over the past 30 years, as a percent of the total hours taught by community colleges in TSTC in Texas, the number of technical hours over the past 30 years has fallen in half. In other words, in the early 80s, we were teaching 50% of all two-year hours were technical. Today, it's hovering at about 25. So what's happening is with the, with the dissolution of shop class in the high school, at this post-secondary uh, areas, this, it, it's been waning there too. So our skills gap is getting worse. Employers are having more and more trouble getting their skills. Meanwhile, the supply is falling. And so we find ourselves in a marketplace that has a demand unlike any we've ever seen before. We're driven by innovation, but here's the cool thing is, I keep thinking about the story of the two antelopes and the lion. You guys know that story? There's two antelopes walking along, and out of the bush pops a lion. 
One antelope turns to the other and says, Oh my gosh, how will we ever outrun this lion? The other antelope says, well, I don't have to outrun the lion. I just have to outrun you. <laughs> so what I would say is the folks we have to outrun are not moving very fast. So it'll be the antelope and the turtle. As long as we keep moving and the rate of change is reasonable for the organization, I think we're going to build our lead. Okay. Chancellor, can I make a remark? Yes. About, mm -hmm. You made some really nice comments about the finance team, and I really appreciate they that. They have done an amazing job. I'm really proud of the management accounting and the um, uh, business analytics sophistication. But this does not happen without the courage and the de determination of Dr. Stuckley, the innovation of Dr. Cravey and um, uh, Kyle Smith, the sales and, and business-minded perspective of Jeff Kilgore. This is a collaboration, and I think that's that's the real well outstanding said. you know achievement that this is. And it doesn't stop here. I mean, we call this version one. We we really need to work with faculty and get their feedback and make sure this is useful for them. And we've started that through formal processes. So that we're very very. Uh, excited about mm. this is about a dialogue a new dialogue and mm. it's you know breaking down we used to have geographic walls kind of have functional walls now and now we have a new focus on product line and so we're just it, so thank you guys for your collaboration um, I think this is just a fantastic um, uh, story of our team that, that's going on so agreed well said Jonathan thank you uh, uh, let me offer one more thing. Bell, why don't stand up? Uh, Bell's an introvert, so she doesn't like doing this. <laughs> this is Bell Whedon. She's a CPA, came to us from banking, and she has been building, with, with the team that she has, she's been building this new managerial accounting uh, kind of function. And she's had to build wholly new data systems. Because none of the stuff we tried to measure before were really easily available in our central computing system. And so she has worked, she literally works 16 hours a day, and her team does too, getting this sort of stuff ready. Because the time to roll this out is during the fall when the faculty and the, line, the business line leaders can actually do something with it. And so she's done a phenomenal job. Part of our response, too, will be tempered by the fact that we fully expect it's possible that some faculty member may go, you know, this number right here looks a little fishy. Could we dive into those data just to make sure that the new systems we've created are actually collecting the whole truth? We, so we have to be very careful with our response because it could be that these brand new systems still have a bug or two in terms of getting the right stuff through. But on whole, it's still an incredibly more valuable instrument panel than we've ever had before. So uh, thank you, Bell. You've done an amazing job. OK, moving on. Um, I'm almost done, Mr. Chairman. I, I warned you we're going to take more time. <laughs> Um, Georgetown University has a really highly regarded and well-known center called the Georgetown Center for Education and Workforce. And the boss of that center is a, is a fellow named Tony Carnevale. And if you have anything to do with workforce, you've heard of Tony Carnevale. Uh, Tony is a friend of ours. In fact, I'm about to show you a study that they released last week. They sent it to us ahead of time said, hey, you guys are going to love this stuff we've been working on. In fact, it's really funny. Michael reached out to Tony, what was it, about a month ago? And you said, hey, Tony, you know, you could really do some more work on this middle skills gap. Da, da, da. And Michael was disappointed Tony didn't answer him. It's like he didn't get an email back for a couple weeks. Well, we now know Tony was working on exactly what Michael had suggested was a rich opportunity for them to do some research. And so I'm going to show you about a two-minute video that captures this. This couldn't be more timely for TSTC right now.
Although the decline in the manufacturing economy has eliminated many good high school jobs, there are still 30 million good jobs for those without a bachelor's degree. These 30 million good jobs account for nearly half of the 75 million workers without a BA. What's more, these good jobs pay well with median salaries of $55,000. So where are these good jobs? The growth of good jobs for workers in skilled service industries, such as financial services and health services, has more than offset the losses in manufacturing. Even with all of these structural changes, manufacturing and transportation are still the two largest industries that provide good jobs to workers without a BA, although their numbers have fallen. High school graduates still have the largest share of good jobs that pay with a BA at 11.6 million, even though that share has declined. Nowadays, good jobs are requiring more and more post-secondary education and training. The share of high school good jobs has declined by 9%, while some college has increased by 11%, and associate's degrees have increased by 83%. In fact, Growth for good jobs requiring associate's degrees and some college education gained 4 million net new good jobs, which has more than offset the over 1 million loss suffered by high school graduates. The American jobs machine has changed. The good news is that there are still good jobs out there for workers who don't have a four-year degree. They just require more education and training beyond high school. The challenge going forward is to match education and training offerings with the demands of these new good jobs. To connect Americans with these good jobs, the first step is to connect colleges, especially community colleges, with employers. Learn more at goodjobsdata.org. J.C. Morgan Chase has been really big into this middle skills issue for a number of years now, and uh, the regard that they have for Carnivale is indicated by the fact that they supported this study. So let's go through this one more time. There are millions of jobs that require more than high school, but not a bachelor's. They pay really well, and manufacturing and transportation remain the biggest sector by a wide margin, but they are softening. The other sectors are growing. That means there's more opportunity there for us. This is really important. This trend will continue for as far out as we can see. Just having a high school diploma is a shrinking market. You aren't going to qualify for these great jobs. The numbers are big, but they're getting smaller at a faster rate than having some college that trains you from a technical standpoint. And associate's degree jobs are the fastest growing sector out there. Colleges, I love this conclusion. It's like a big duh. Colleges should work with employers. Why didn't I think of that? <laughs> That's a great idea. So. I'll tell you what's really great for this. As, we, as we've already started on our interim strategy for the legislature for 19, and everywhere we go, we're evangelizing the notion of technical training is the new cool thing. Having external validators like this is going to make our job much, much easier. And this is a growing acknowledgement among the various thought leaders. Michael was over at American Enterprise Institute and told me this morning there's an entire half day spent on this whole notion of uh, middle skills topics. And when thought leaders like that start to go, eventually the elected officials are going to notice. So shame on us if we aren't ready when they turn to us and go, hey, it's your turn. So I can assure you we'll be ready. With that, I conclude my remarks. Okay, Mike, great, thank you. Um, Jeff, I think you had uh, something you wanted to add, correct? Thank you, Chancellor. Um, I don't know if we're going to break at lunch through this at some point, Chairman, but... As soon as you're done, so... This is a perfect segue. Uh, to follow the context that Regent Honey was wanting to uh, instill today, instead of diving right into the reports on 
uh, how we sell or how we produce, and, and we'll do all that coming out of committees. We thought maybe some some context may be especially good for our new regents coming on board. Um, a picture is worth a thousand words, and as Chair or Regent Skinner would say, in my case, a picture is worth ten thousand words. Uh, we ask our communications department to kind of put together a, a new series of what we're going to call a, a TSDC digital diary. And uh, this is kind of a longer context of time, maybe from the beginning of summer. But basically, we want to show you guys what's really going on here. You're going to see a lot of reports. You're going to hear a lot of numbers. You heard some tremendous business strategy, the things that Chancellor Reeser talked about. I spent 20 years in four-year higher education, and you have never or will never hear that. It's even heresy in some places. Uh, but we want to show you what's going on here at TSTC. Many of you have been at TSTC. You may get to campus on occasionally, uh, but there's no way you can see everything that's going on statewide, and there's no way we can take it all to you. So we figured once a quarter when you come here to meet, we will have an update of what happened since the last time you were here to today. Um, Mike has always impressed upon me. Uh, the first rule of marketing is to be good. Well, we want to show you how good TSTC is. And to introduce the video, uh, Nick Alvarado is our Vice President of Communication. And he is the one that is responsible for all of our creativity, our advertising. Uh, he really brings data analysis to our marketing research and to our efforts. So Nick, thank you for your production. We look forward to seeing it and breaking for lunch. Thank you, Jeff. Um, again, uh, Jeff has said quite a bit, so I don't want to uh, stall much longer. But uh, again, this is just a moment just to kind of get away from the heavy and we'll kind of look back and see what are some of the things that we've done here at TSTC that make it so special and those moments that create with, with our students and our, our employees across the state. So um, I hope you all enjoy. Take a peek into TSTC's digital diary to see what's been happening at TSTC. I'm studying dental hygiene, and what I like most about TSTC is that the people are very friendly. Hashtag seat safe. Welcome week. Statewide open houses. Workforce Solutions check signings. Skills Development Grant is a partnership between the Texas Workforce Commission and a college like TSTC. In this case, we go on site at local companies and train their workers in new technologies.
groundbreaking in Abilene. This project is all about taking TSTC to a whole new level in not only Abilene but the region. TSTC Texan Days. Burger Bash. Uh, WSC Burger Bash, end of the year celebration. Thanking all the kids for coming by to the Wellness Support Center. West Texas Team Cook-Off Challenge. TSTC Employee Appreciation Days. Industry Career Days. First graduation, Fort Bend County Campus. Stand proud in knowing that you will soon be inducted into a special membership, 100,000 strong, of TSTC alumni. And finally, stand proud in knowing that you will forever be the first class of graduates from TSTC in Fort Bend County. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Chairman Hunter. That, Chairman Hunter, that concludes our report, except saying that obviously there's a whole lot of good in there, or as we like to say, a whole lot of gooder in there. And I'll echo what Jonathan says. There's not a person in this room that's not directly responsible for everything that you saw there. So thank you. Great. Thanks, Jeff. And thanks, Nick. That was a really nice presentation and uh, certainly gives us a flavor for all the activities that go on. And uh, well done. Well done. Really, really worthwhile. Uh, Mike, thanks for your comments. Uh, any of the regents have anything before we break for lunch? All right, we're going to uh, recess for lunch. It's uh, 1227. I'd really like to uh, resume the meeting by 1 o'clock. So let's shoot for a 1 o'clock restart. Uh, at this time, we'll uh, adjourn for lunch.
right, at this time we'll resume uh, the board meeting of November 16th. Uh, it's 1.09 p.m. Um, now it's time to move into the uh, committee section of the agenda. Uh, first committee for reports is student learning and student development and committee chair Joe Grecki. Thank you. Uh, met this morning with Dr. Suckley for a few minutes. Uh, since there were no minute orders, I went ahead and spent some time also in the audit committee meeting. And at this time, I would like to call on Dr. Stuckley to uh, give us a report, please. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, uh, what you have on the report is uh, the Board of Regents honor graduates for summer of 2017. Uh, there are 58 total awards this time, 51 total students that are honor graduates for us. There were six students that have multiple awards. But I think one thing that's interesting to see is you heard the Chancellor talk earlier on about taking our curriculum and breaking it down and building stepping stones for students. In the past, you've probably seen a, a high number of associate degrees and fewer certificates. But this particular time, there are 33 associate and 25 certificates, which is a building trend for us to, to build based on skill sets and not just looking at degrees or awards. It's what are the skills needed. And by breaking, taking those skills and grouping them together to, to form a curriculum that is good for the students to be able to come here get trained and get out in the skills that they really want. And so that is, we feel like that's, there, we've made a lot of strides in that. Uh, eight of the 10 locations are represented here. I will say there is one thing that I found as many times as I've looked at this on page 26, where it says TSTC West Texas, Miss Nicole M. Wiley, that should say TSTC Sweetwater. And so I apologize for that. I normally catch those things, but in this particular case, I did not. Uh, uh, but uh, again, there's a uh, we have we have representation from 80% of our locations across the state as far as on our graduates are concerned. So, any questions? Yes. We talked before about micro credentials. How does all that fit in? I'm sorry. The micro credentials, or the are we still doing that kind of a, yes. the, the, the skill the micro, by skill? The micro credentials that we put together, mm -hmm. then we package them together, mm -hmm. and you know, a cert one is like nine to fifteen semester credit hours, mm -hmm. and so we're, we're still in the process of taking that curriculum. Right now, from what I understand, we're at about 71% of our programs broken down into skill sets, and we're looking at packaging those, whether it's a CERT 1, CERT 2, associate degree, and building those those pathways. When you look at the, the uh, students that have multiple awards, some have AASs, some have certificates, they're kind of picking and choosing what they want and to, to get back to what Chairman Honey said this morning about new technology and new programs, we're in a day and age where it's it's taking bits and pieces now of, of, of technologies that are already there and packaging them and taking bits and pieces to form new awards from those particular uh, skill sets that make up in some of the other technologies. And that's what we want to continue to do. It gives a, a student an opportunity to, it's sort of like at a, a at a buffet. You kind of pick and choose what you want instead of just going somewhere and saying, whoop, this is what you have to take. And we, we, we know what we want uh, to give you. And it gives them more flexibility in choosing their career path and the skills uh, that they need. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Chairman Gorecki. Uh Next up is the Committee for Strategic Relations, Chairman Hearn. Mr. Chairman, we had uh, a good meeting this morning, well-attended meeting. I really had a gallery this morning, so it, it turned out really well. Uh, we discussed uh, the safety program here within the uh, college system, and it appears that it's really doing well. And from a financial standpoint, uh, we don't have anything that's costing us anything as a result of injuries that may have happened on campus. And uh, Roger Miller provided a legislative update regarding the, uh, the interim, and he will provide a comprehensive report 
to the board in January so that all the board members are really aware of what's going on down in the legislature. <laughs> Jenny Gooden discussed an employer, employer survey that will be sent out in spring 2018 and she'll give a report on that activity in fall of 2018. The reason for this survey, we decided, the chairman decided that to close the loop, we needed to understand whether we were providing the kind of products that our customers really wanted from our students. So this will help us close the gap, make sure that we're training for what we want and the customers appreciate what we're giving them. Hannah Love uh, will give a, a report on the unfinished portion of our meeting uh, about the uh, employee engagement survey. We have one minute order 3817C, approval of the TSTC Foundation operating plan update for the period September 1, 2017 through August 31, 2018. <coughs> and Beth Wooten will give that. And she'll also give an oral report. And then we'll have an oral report by uh, <coughs> Ralph Wallover. And where's Ms. Wooten? Is she there? Yeah, she'll join us here. So every year we've been rebuilding the operations of the of a truly vibrant foundation. Uh, the first first step was the back office, building a database for alumni, uh, then active development strategies in which we were going out to actively fundraise now, donor retention programs, and alumni network. Uh, in your report, you will see on one of the pages, it's a big circle, TSTC Foundation, but it shows the actual roles and values that the foundation plays on behalf of the college. Uh, <clears throat> we could have built a standalone institutional development office without having a separate 501c3, but the underlying values that a 501c3 provides for the institution, as some of you may know or may not, uh, it's the arm length relationship that we can do and act and do business on behalf of the college that it may not can do as a state agency or it may prefer not to do. Uh, spending flexibility is one of those reasons. Uh, strategic financing partnerships, the way that we have funded some of our new campuses around the state. And then also we're building its effort to uh, explore more strategic business partnerships with the foundation that will create more unrestricted revenues and accounts that we can spend for students, for instruction, for faculty that we may not be able to do as a state agency. Uh, we've been very proud of its progress. Uh, its first pass, it raised funds to sponsor our 50th anniversary celebration, which was very successful in Austin. Uh, last year was our first annual stab at an annual drive for scholarship with a million dollar goal, which was surpassed. Uh, so we're cutting our teeth where we think we should belong, focusing our students. It's still in its adolescence, but Beth will tell you the healthy progress that's being made. And I want to thank her as, as Vice President for the TSTC Foundation and also for advancement at TSTC. So thank you for bearing with the little context there, but I wanted to provide that background. Well, Jeff just gave my report, so I'm just kidding. Um, uh, so yes, I'm here to present the minute order. I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Chairman, just for just for clarity uh, and to let the minute re reflect, uh, Curtis Cleveland absented himself from this presentation for both the appearance of impropriety and he'll also abstain from the vote that has this minute order. Need the minutes to reflect that. Okay, thank you. 
Okay, so uh, as Jeff mentioned, I'm here to present uh, the minute order uh, for the approval of the TSCC Foundation Operating Plan, uh, which is in accordance to the General Appropriations Act. Um, Jeff kind of went through and gave you a little background of where we've been over the last four to five years. We have been in an, our infancy in working to build uh, long-term sustainability for the college and also to build a culture of philanthropy for the college. Uh, and so we kind of view our primary uh, role uh, to, is to build uh, strategic relationships, uh, to raise money, uh, unrestricted uh, dollars, uh, scholarship dollars, gift in kind, uh, and then also to, to serve as a strategic business partner with the college. Uh, in your board notebook, I believe it's on page 29, you will see the actual foundation operating plan. I'm not going to read the entire plan for you. I trust that you all have read it. Um, but I, what I do want to point out and, and just spend a few minutes on is on the last page, it's, you will see a, a four-year gift report. Uh, it's a four-year trend report on our overall, uh, it kind of gives you a glance of our fundraising successes over the last four years. Uh, and uh, what I am proud to, to let you all know is that in the last four years, the foundation has seen an increase of 250% in our gifts in kind, our cash, and our capital gifts. And we've also seen a 36% increase in our overall donors. And those are the two uh, data points at the end of each fiscal year that I can determine whether or not we've been successful. And I'm proud to let the Board of Regents know that I feel like uh, we have been successful over the course of, of the last four years and uh, we'll con hopefully continue to see those trends rise. Uh, did you have a question, sir? You okay. Uh, and so the, if you have any questions about the four-year trend report, please feel free to ask. Um, or. Regent Hearn has anything to add. Uh, but briefly what I'll do is go over the eight primary strategies that we uh, plan to focus on for this next fiscal year. Uh, and that is also outlined in the front um, page five, I believe it is, of uh, the actual operating plan. Some of these strategies are uh, strategies that we continue to work on every single year. They're not new strategies, but they're important in our work. Uh, and so a few of those are, are uh, ex strategies that we've uh, had for the last few years. And then a few of them are new strategies for us where we've identified areas that we need to focus on. And so this is a collection of, of those. So the, uh, I'll just briefly go through them. And like I said, feel free to ask questions uh, if you like. Uh, so we plan to continue to enhance our donor recognition and retention program efforts, uh, manage real and other assets, and continue to explore opportunities for the benefit of the college. Uh, continue to work to increase the total amount of income and number of annual donors by 10%. Increase our alumni engagement by 10%. Increase the amount of external funding uh, through grants, uh, private foundation grants awarded to the foundation by 10%. Uh, we do uh, in plan to increase our legislative affairs support service. We uh, hope to continue to grow unrestricted revenues by exploring and developing and expanding business ventures with the college. That's where we come in as a strategic business partner for the college. And then finally, uh, increase our industry and employer engagement and fundraising efforts. We've, uh, we've learned some things in the last four years and that uh, our primary uh, donor market, potential donor market, is not our alumni. Um, it's not the same at TSTC as it is at, at a four-year institution. And so what we've learned is, is that our, uh, our primary donor market is our industry uh, partners and our employers, the folks that actually hire our students. And so uh, that pretty much sums up my, uh, my report. Uh, I'll entertain any questions, or I guess Jeff has something for me to add. Way, uh, <laughs> um, we're more proactively pursuing 
higher levels of industry relationships. I really feel that our opportunity in the future, our growth market for donor relations, is not just with industry, but taking program vitality and alignment with the relevance in the workforce between the needs and our production lines, that we stay relevant, but even a step further that we can get ourselves in a position that we can go to major industry or major industry sectors and actually build the spec. And we get in that position, we can really leverage fundraising and donations or paying the place, so to speak, for major industry sectors or industry partners. So that's where we're trying to position the foundation to be the industry interface between our output talent management programs and industry relations seeking to hire that talent. So there's a weaving in, in that as well. So that's just a little future project there. Um, what, how do those employers or, or, or communities find out about what, what TSTC needs that they could possibly donate or, or buy? How do they go about knowing those, what is needed by TSTC? Yes, sir. Well, uh, so we have actual field development officers that, uh, at each, almost all of our locations, and they serve as our front face of the foundation and they're the ones that are on the front lines building relationships and managing those uh, key relationships with employers to, to letting, letting, letting them know what our needs are and what their opportunities are to get involved with us. Does that answer your question? Okay. Well, one other thing that I would like to just say in, in closing if there are any other questions, but sometimes we, we get caught up in the whirlwind of everything that we do on the day to day and in my world in fundraising, it's, it's easy to lose sight of the benefit that the TSTC Foundation truly provides to the college. And the true benefit that I believe that we provide not only just being a strategic business partner for the college, but is to actually help the students that walk through our doors. This, over this last year, we awarded over $650,000 in student scholarships and in aid. And I have story after story after story that I could share with you that would pull on your heartstrings. Um, but it's a, it's a really good reminder of what the foundation can do for the college. Um, and it makes our case for support when we're out in the field asking folks to write us a check. It makes a great case for support. I just have one the informational question that might be helpful for uh, Tony and Alex. Uh, can you put in context the size of the foundation staff, uh, kind of how, how, how extensive, how big is it, and so they get some idea of how, sure. you know, what the resources we apply to this are right now. Yes, sir. So um, uh, four years ago, four or five years ago, the TSTC Foundation consisted of two staff members. And today we have 14 and a half, I believe. Uh, we actually have one a, half body running around somewhere. <laughs> Can't ever catch it. We, we, we have a gentleman in Hutto now that's actually dual rolling. He's serving in a student recruitment role as well as uh, the foundation role. So uh, we, we roughly have a 14 and a half staff members of the foundation. And then also within my area of advancement, um, the Office of Sponsored Programs uh, is a part of our team, and those are the folks that are out in the field. Um, uh, write, they're the grant writers. They, they handle the front end, and then they handle the back end uh, of, of all the grant activities that happen. Can, can I add on to that, Beth? Uh, the original charge was not to build a development office or team. Mike's charge was to build a culture of philanthropy. And so our development staff, while they're actively being players, they're actually player coaches and trying to build an overall culture where to answer your question, how do, how do we know when we get gifts from it? A lot of times it's the instructors themselves that are engaging with different folks that hire their graduates or provide consumables or, you know, what have you. So it's not just the development staff fundraising in and of themselves. A lot of the credit in the numbers and the reports you saw don't just reflect their own hands in work, but the work in the hands of the whole that is really buying in and, and understanding this culture of philanthropy from em employee drives and instructor drives and student drives. So the kudos to the entire organization for pushing this along. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, next presenter uh, is Rob Walliver. 
with the enrollment update. This will be the last time I add context, Mr. <laughs> Chairman. <laughs> um, <coughs> three years ago when we went through single accreditation, and Nelson's about to get his hour clock out when, he, when I do the presentation. Um, we, as we combine the colleges of the, of the organization, we also combine sales forces. And so we went through an a, a, a analytics period where we looked into how are we doing the things that we do in recruitment. Um, and we were doing them four different kinds of ways and reporting and counting them four different kinds of ways. Even in the whole higher ed headcount way, it was all done different ways. And uh, we didn't have anybody to lead that effort up. Uh, we had a provost in Waco at that time named Rob Walliver who's sitting beside me, and, uh, and with a little arm twisting and Gail's charm, uh, Rob became our first, first statewide overall enrollment boss. And he really dug under the hood of these processes over the last two years, analyzed demand on the sales side of things, processes in the middle. And what we found when we peeled the hood open, we found we were kind of in our own way. You know, following the recession years where students were lined up at every educational institution across the country, processes were built up on controlling that demand. Well, when the recession turned, you know, we had enrollment and sales strategies that were dependent upon people showing up. And so then they quit showing up. We didn't know how to go get them. Uh, and when, then when we found them, we had a lot of, you got to get over this, 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 and this. So Rob, Rob rolled his sleeves up, dug into that, and over the last two or three period, the significant thing that we've been able to prove to ourselves again and when you can manage enrollment and not just do enrollment management you can diverge from the econ the impact of economic trends typically higher ed follows the the the, ec the economic trends that are going on when there's no jobs higher ed goes up and vice versa what we did last year that was significant is we diverged away from that trend when the rest of higher ed has continued to dip because jobs are great we actually spiked up and we proved that we could manage enrollment through those different trends. Uh, we basically pushed everything at head counts. Let's go drive and see how many numbers we can shove into this place. And we did that. And he'll show you how we grew that respectively 17% and 11% on the real paying customer. And so on this last iteration, one step further, we decided now let's align these sales strategies with the business pivot that the chancellor showed you earlier and look at other things deeper or differently than just headcount, but contribution margin, avenue, average revenue per student, things that you would do as a business if you were out there selling to customers. Uh, again, I said earlier, you know, more is not always better, but more better is. So, Rob, that's kind of some context, Chairman. If Rob, if you'd give our report. Good, good. Mr. Chairman, uh, Regents, thank you for giving time. Jeff, I appreciate the compliment. Jeff actually gives me far more credit than I deserve. I just am fortunate enough to be able to be the guy to sit here and give you the report. There's a whole lot of folks, some of them are probably watching today, that are pulling the levers that really do uh, the bulk of the work across divisions, not just in enrollment management, particularly on the operations and student learning side and the faculty. And it's a, it's a collaborative effort that's resulted in our successes over the over the past two years, I, I just get to give you the report. So uh, thanks for the compliment, but it's uh, certainly not deserved. Um, generally speaking, what we've discovered is when, when uh, and, and Chancellor teed my report up better than, than I was prepared for, so thank you, Mr. Chancellor. You, you made my job easy on doing this today. Generally speaking, what we found is, you know, when people want to know how's your enrollment what they're asking is are you serving more students this year than you were serving last year that's really what stakeholders are, are interested in knowing and traditionally the way those get reported and what y'all have seen those in in the past or the way we report those to you is a, is a picture that includes basically three different demographics traditional students are paying customers that are here those that are dual enrollment students who are students at a high school level taking a college course but receiving high school credit for it and then there's a category on there of flex entries that for for lack of a better uh, word or explanation is kind of uh, accounting errors the the training and learning happened in one enrollment period but it happened to be past the deadline of reporting so they get rolled on to the next period so that kind of the official numbers sometimes are not a a broad um, depiction of actually the work that's taken place um, in each of those those learning cycles. So the simple the simple answer to that question um, for the past two years has been yes, we are. 
Um, as as um, Jeff and the Chancellor mentioned, last year that, that certified number was a 17% enrollment mark um, for TSTC. Uh, the traditional student component of that, those paying customers who were here uh, during that enrollment period, if you will, was an 11% growth. What we've managed to do over this past year and moving into this fall was hold that 11% growth that we had last fall and actually add on to it about another 1%, uh, a, a slight additional growth over that 11% this last fall um, for, for the fall that we're, we're in um, and we're in currently. Um, some things happened this last year intentionally. Uh, when, you look at the, when you look at the program vitality scorecards and being more strategic and beginning to focus away from, as, 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 as Jeff mentioned, the, just packing students in, to being more strategic about how we do that and where it makes most sense, where those uh, contribution margins are the best, where there's the highest employment opportunities for those students and, and get a little deeper into how we do that. Some things changed this past year that, that had some effects. We, we redirected how we approached dual enrollment, uh, making sure that we were really focusing on career track programs and not just students across across the boards that resulted in fewer dual credit enrollments for us this year than we had last year but that was something that the institution did intentionally for for the right reason um, we made some changes some programmatic changes offerings uh, this past year um, kind of Regent Skinner you'd ask that about on the program vitality some you know, we some programs that we made decisions about this past fall that it just didn't really make sense for the institution to continue to offer those the career earning potentials for those students were just not that good and so that set us back some available seats that we we, we had to sell if you will for this coming fall so I'm proud of the fact that the the faculty on, on Dr. Stuckley's side and, and faculty and staff across everywhere pulled together and we were able to hold not only just hold that 11 percent but add to it uh, another 1 percent given that we changed the dynamics from one enrollment term um, to, to the other. Rob, can I go ahead and interject the real numbers that he's talking about there? What we did, we made it to, after we finished the last cycle of the 17 percent, we in the leadership team, we decided to change the dual enrollment direction. And the net difference of that is actually about 931 students less to be able to recruit that he recruited last year into that 17% number. On the traditional side of the house, the number reduced was about anywhere from three to 400 students that were in the programs that we closed that were losing us currently money. So essentially what we did to Rob, we said, hey, great job on the 17%. We want, he's very goal oriented. Let's go beat that number again next year. But by the way, you're going to start out minus 1,300 before you start, apples to apples. And so saying we held the 11 percent or he held, we all held the 11 percent plus added is considering we started that far behind with the, uh, with, the, with the changes in programs, which really is a very initial step of program vitality. So if you take a, a situational analysis of the, of the landscape of the whole two-year market, um, for the state of Texas, the, us in the community colleges, you know, over, over the past two years. In, in, in 2016, the two-year market as a whole, all of the community colleges saw about a 1.6% enrollment increase, basically flat uh, across the state, in which in the same time from traditional paying students, we were at 11%. If you put the dual credits and all of those in, added up to a 17%, which would be, you know, apples and apples with, with their certified number. For 2017, for this year, you know, our position is, is some marginal, some slight marginal growth in that 1%. It appears from the preliminary data that we're seeing from the community colleges um, that on a whole, they're going to be actually down this fall, uh, about 0.2%. So again, holding flat. One of the things that, that is interesting when you look at the dynamics of that growth in the market is that we're, continue, we're continuing to grow um, progressively in the traditional student. Our, our student makeup population, our full-time, part-time students who are paying customers every day with us, 
that piece is increasing and our dual enrollment piece has taken a decrease. It appears that on the, the rest of the two-year market, there's kind of an inverse trend with that. The, the dual enrollment um, sector of their, of, their, of their student bodies seems to be on an incline rather than on a decline. So our, our picture looks a little bit different um, from the rest of the, the two-year two landscape um, as a whole. There's actually a handout in, uh, uh, in the Oh, hold on, Bob. One of the other things, here's a series of reports that will kind of paint the picture for the section that Rob's about to get into uh, on the optics change. The first couple of uh, pages are actually the numbers against the higher two-year sector. Uh, the second page is the composition change, which Rob is uh, alluding to. Two-year market is, grow is staying flat by growing its less productive student headcounts. It's growing its dual credit headcounts and shrinking its traditional pain. Uh, TSTC, differently, we're, that's the, we're growing ourselves by increasing our traditional student headcount and giving way to those that are not making, making money for us. Uh, Jonathan's group has put together these new optics in which we'll, the way we want to measure uh, our performance, not on the old headcount game, but it's on impact to business. Uh, you can see a couple of pretty significant things in there when you're talking about the difference between the traditional headcount and the dual credit headcount. Is the traditional headcount earnings or revenues per student is, I believe, about 1700 per student. The dual credit student is $100 per student. And if you look at the impact to the budget as a whole, traditional students, I, I believe Jonathan uh, netted us $45 million in revenue, and the total revenue impact of dual credit students was $156,000. And so, <clears throat> but in the headcount game, they count equally one to one. So that's why we're trying to make a business pivot shift away from, we don't want to come in here and just give you a headcount report the old traditional higher ed game, because there's so many variables that someone can play. We want to get deeper into the optics, and we want you to have the optics of what you measure us by is deeper than the head itself, but into the revenues generated by that head, the average revenue per head, and then ultimately the entire contribution margin for the institution on enrollment, and then we can begin to break those same analytics down by program. Jeff, say that again between the between the traditional student and the um, the revenue impact, yeah, the dual credit. It's on page. Uh, you can see it. It's it's reflected on pages three and four, four. and five on the uh, reports, and that's why we wanted to show you these numbers versus just Sam. But you can see that the uh, the total. Uh, if you go to the uh, report that shows. There you go. That one. The total TSTC revenue and enrollment trends, traditional students' annual totals, uh, it shows 16, 17, and 18. Projected. Uh, 18 is projected, but 17 is final. Uh, the traditional students' revenues, annual revenues, should be between 38 and $44 million this year. Against the dual credit impact, which is on the following sheet, that the total budget impact on dual credit ranges from seventeen one hundred and fifty nine thousand dollars to potentially three hundred thirteen thousand. So you're looking at tens of millions of dollars of differences, and then average per student that goes from about seven to fifteen to seventeen hundred per student revenue versus a hundred dollars revenue per student. Well, let me ask you a question. Why do we do it? <clears throat> We have been examining our position in dual credit. One is the individual business line in and of itself. Uh, because of House Bill 5, and the Chancellor can correct me two years ago, began to encourage technical education and, and secondary education. It began to be a very crowded market. Superintendents are looking for those partners to be able to check those boxes that they receive funding on. And so two-year schools, even four-year schools now are beginning to crowd that market. We got into it as well. Uh, we're examining what its value is to the organization, not only as a business line in and of itself, which reflects these numbers, 
But it's an important negotiating tool in which if you go to a superintendent you're wanting to build a relationship with an ISD, which you want to go in and have a relationship then where you can recruit their traditional students, they're going to ask you, we need you to do this for us. Uh, but the, the challenge that it was, as a business line of itself, it was, it, we were not being able, we had never were able to charge for it, nor do we receive appropriations from the state for it, which is different from everyone else in higher education. They're getting paid appropriations for these dual credit jobs, and we're not. And so Jeff, could I comment on that part yes. of it? <clears throat> During the last legislative session, we spent a lot of time educating the leadership in the legislature that because of our unique formula, we don't actually get paid appropriated money for dual credit. And we found a very uh, willing audience to listen to our message. We can't guarantee you that that's going to change by the next uh, le legislature, but we have reason to hope it will. And that at that point, we will start getting paid exactly the same way the community colleges do for dual credit. So, so the outlook in terms of the revenue um, while not certain, is, is, is better than it was before. Thank, thank you, Roger. But it has, it has several values to the company. We're exploring the, uh, you know, how valuable they will be. One of them may be matriculation. One of them may be uh, appropriations from the state. And sometimes this is community relations. Uh, so yes. we will have to determine to what degree of investment. That, go ahead, Elton. Can I add to that, to that as well? One of the things when we looked at dual credit, you know, be, when we used to chase contact hours, we were just offering the old onesies and twosies. Anybody that needed uh, anything, we, we chunked it in there. However, over the last two years, we focused on these career pathways, on setting up opportunities for students in, in technical career pathways that House Bill 5 let us, uh, gave us an opportunity to, uh, I feel like, to get in there and help the kids while they're in high school to ultimately uh, earn, as I mentioned in my uh, report on honor graduates, to earn a s level one certificate, possibly a level two, so that when they do graduate from high school, they have an award and could go to work, continue their education if they wish so it's it's a game plan we no longer offer you heard the the decrease in numbers in and dual credit uh, students compared to last year we no longer on, no longer offer academic dual credit because every community college does we're focusing on what we can do to help a student while they're in high school get an award and be able to go to work I've got a couple of questions um, with the additional campuses we've opened, um, I guess, how, what are the trends at the new locations in terms of enrollment? Are we seeing significant growth there? I know we had the flood at Fort Bend and that had some effect, but in general, what are, our, what are we seeing? What are our expectations there? Um, so that's one question. The second one is, you know, Mike's talking about training for technical programs is 25 percent of what it was is that what you said mike uh, we saw a slide that said there's 30 million uh students or positions out there that pay fifty-five thousand dollars or more um it's just globally to me intuitively it seems like we ought to be beat, beating people away from the door to get in here and i'm so i'm trying to rationalize all that what what do we got to do or what's what's happening? Why aren't we seeing more increases in enrollment? I'll start with the first question. Um, the floods impacted us some this year. Uh, we, we can't quantify exactly how much, but we saw other institutions around the state, Coastal Bend, Lamar, they took 5 to 10 percent hits on their enrollment this year. Uh, we probably saw 3 to 4 percent if I was guessing. We were setting around 7 percent ahead on first day of class when the hurricane hit and we melted that back down to about one or two percent uh, not just in Fort Bend County but we feed Waco and Harlingen strongly from the Gulf Coast region um, so there was impact but Fort Bend still in of itself it I believe was 470 we've got we've got about 120 more students in Fort Bend this fall than we did the fall uh, before even after um, the hurricane that's probably Fort Bend's actually a really good story to tell in that all the calamity that 
the folks down there went through, the resiliency was obvious when we came back and opened. They all showed back up, much to my surprise. I actually had a much more um, kind of a pessimistic outlook, I guess, for what we were going to be post-hurricane at Fort Bend than it actually turned out. I'm really proud of, of what those folks down there did to, to accommodate and get all of those folks back in, um, in, in after the hurricane. On the other two startup locations, Red Oak has grown at a better pace than East Williamson County. Uh, I believe program vitality will have a better sense of what programs belong into what markets as we go through this new business approach on things. Uh, <clears throat> they, they're not going to grow as a helicopter. There'll be more of a runway in a takeoff. Um, but we're beginning to look, while we we'll still <clears throat> concern ourselves with program or location vitality, we're shifting our optics more toward the business lines themselves through vitality. I think one of the flaws in the way in which we've measured ourselves are three or fourfold, which we've kind of illuminated in this presentation. We've looked at headcounts only. We've looked by location. And we've looked from the optics of a single sales period measuring the annual performance of our sales. And typically, that's the fall. Higher ed reports fall numbers. Well, really, it's not a quarter system, but that's relative is, is taking your business and reporting first quarter sales and determining whether your annual sales was successful or not. And so we're going to shift from head counts to locations to single period of sales to the depth of the enrollments into annual types of sales, program sales, and so forth and so on. Um, location will still continue to be important. Uh, the, the Waco and Harlingen's have continued, you know, they hold most of the girth of the state from an enrollment perspective. When they drop one or two percent, it impacts the overall number. Um, the startups, I believe, are growing healthily, in my opinion. Um, the, uh, the rules in the, the east and west, Marshall, for the first time, took a, took a hit in the last two years. Its sales have been up new and returning. Uh, but they also had two new companies that onboarded this last year. And so the economy does have an impact on new sales ability and growth. When, when there are jobs out there that you can get paid, you know, $15, $20 an hour, and, of course, they're all over the Gulf Coast like that right now, people aren't going to line up at the doors. You have to really aggressively go and, go and hunt for them. I'd like, to, I'd like to add to that if I could. Um, you know, what we found by studying these students is there are three primary influencers for a kid when they make a decision on a college. The first is their peer group. I mean, what teenager isn't paying attention to what everybody else is doing? Uh, the second is their family. And the third are the educational professionals in their life, typically high school counselors or teachers or things like that. Um, we can have, our sales effort can have some influence on the first one, the kids and their peers. That's who we're calling on. That's who we're doing our direct sales, all of our online and social media advertising. It's all rifle shots right to that demographic. We know it's working because all of our kids or grandkids who are teenagers keep calling us up going, oh, I just saw TSTC on my cell phone. Um, so that part we can move. We, there's not enough money in our budget to change the minds of all the families out there or to solve the information shadow that they have about these educational possibilities. Kids are making choices based on biases that were created decades ago. And that is, if you don't go to university, you're a failure. And if you go to a tech school, it's a consolation prize. I don't think we have enough money in our budget to solve that problem. So we've turned to people like the, you know, manufacturing associations and the various industrial partners and said, you've got to help us with that stakeholder group. And then finally, we're beginning to see with HB5 a while ago and the new commissioner of education, Mike Morath, at the K-12 level, we're beginning to see some movement there. But it remains, and I personally go around the state doing counselor education sessions, and, and so do others, in an attempt to get them to realize how lucrative our technical fields are. 
And it's amazing how uninformed they are about these career possibilities. They just don't know. And on, on top of it, it's really bad because these people, to be a high school counselor, you have to have a master's degree. And so they believe that more education is better. Look at me, I'm an example. But then they are crestfallen when we show them that our welders make more money than you. So, um, but it's one high school at a time, one mind at a time. We can't spend enough money on mass media to do the got milk campaign that it would take to change those other two influencers. So what we have most control over is the kid themselves and that's where we're spending our time. We're seeking help through uh, state agencies and you know TEA and folks like that on this group. And then this group right here, we're looking to industry and saying, until you do a sales job on the value of your careers, we aren't gonna, we won't be able to move the family needle. So does that shed more light on it? Yeah, that helps. I, I understand it's a big, it's a big issue and it probably takes a lot of money to address it. Um, it, it just seems like it's, uh, it's a big treasure out there to trove. And so somehow, some way with what little resources we have, we need to really be strategic in how we apply those to get as many many students interested in those programs that have a return as we can. Mr. And Chairman. I, I know Roger and the team in, in Austin, Mike, do uh, spend a lot of time probably talking to the legislature about, you, you know, you want graduates of technical programs to fill your jobs in your state so that we can continue to grow and pay more taxes and make Texas more successful. And uh, we can't do that uh, unless we get some more money. And um, so that, I know that's a message. At the end of the day, we're sort of lumped in with everybody else, but we just really have to beat that, I think. And, and the regions can do that as well with, uh, with their local legislators when they talk to them and uh, local shakers and movers. So uh, it seems like that's, that's a, a rich uh, field for us to increase our uh, enrollment and, and, and ultimately our product. Yeah. Well, well, we agree with you. Um, nationally, the trend in two-year colleges right now is a slow decline over the past eight years. So if we hold level or grow at all, we're beating the national trend. Um, and uh, if we were to get paid by the legislature the amount of money that we, you know, earned, then I will tell you, putting more money into this would be a high priority. Um, I, uh, I personally lobby virtually every industry I talk to to try to help us change the optics, if you will, on career, f you know, technical career fields. They have war chests that dwarf our total budget. And we've had some associations say, you know, we really need to talk to our members about that, about a kind of a, in the same way that our country solved its litter problem with a big mass media campaign, uh, you know, don't mess with Texas, that worked. Corporate, the corporate employers are the ones that are going to have to change this bias situation because we aren't big enough to change it by ourselves. We'll do it one classroom, one cohort of students that we meet with at a time. And that's, a, and so, we're seeking as much help as we can. But we are turning to trade organizations. We had two discussions last week with one very large trade association and one relatively large one. And, you know, they have all these monies that were allocated in heavy, you know, highway contracts and so forth. But they said, but we don't have talent. We need you to provide that. And I said, well, sir, we appreciate that and we appreciate you coming for us. But on the other side of that same appropriation, we got reduced. And when we get reduced, we can't take it out of our product line because we have to be good. We take it out of sales. And our advertising budget was $1.2 million for the entire state. And we directed 66% of that to our startups. But there's just the reality of resource that we're going to need industry to fill the void that the state's not going to. Jeff, to echo that more, um, uh, we're seeing more reports like what we just saw from Georgetown 
when Tony Car Carnavali and that center publishes those national studies and they get picked up in the media, it helps change those cultural barriers. Uh, also highly encouraged that groups like American Enterprise Institute and others are gathering their industry associations and funding more studies like that because a lot of employers are complaining about these skill shortages. So we're seeing more and more national movements about these types of issues and those media campaigns are somewhat like the Got Milk campaigns, um, which will bolster our own brand. Uh, so that, that's encouraging to see that happening at a national level. I ju also, we just passed out a, uh, an agenda for an upcoming event. The work that we've been doing with these various organizations is beginning to germinate, and this is an example. Um, Educate Texas and, and these, these three uh, industrial or foundation players came to us a month or so ago and said, we want to help you grow. And so we're going to, and we want to help you make sure you get the funding you earn through your results-based formula. So we're going to start helping you with that sort of stuff. This is an example where some legislative leaders are being brought to the Waco campus, not by us, but by these folks. And they'll be the ones doing the, doing the arguing for, this is the kind of school that we want you to focus on. And so the years of working with that, those groups is beginning to bear fruit. That's an example of an early one. And, and our hope is to continue to, to do that through the interim so it has an impact that, that we're funded according to our earnings next session and that um, the industries or the legislature will create more incentives to overcome the bias against middle skills. Chairman May? <clears throat> the, the Chancellor indicated that nationally uh, two-year sector is pretty well flat. That is definitely true for the state of Texas. And what we see is they're maintaining flat enrollment by aggressive pursuit of dual credit. They're giving it away. And so their traditional matriculation is declining. And, we're, and so when you do an apples-to-apples -apples comparison, that, that revenue-based uh, enrollments Ours are way outperforming our two-year uh, peers. So um, we got into a little bit of that with S&P when we had our uh, bond rating uh, surveillance call. And my explanation to them, they were asking about dual credit decreases um, because they're used to seeing, you know, pursuit of that and growth in that. And I said, well, those students that we lost accounted for about $20,000 last year. And so while it looks significant on a headcount perspective, your bonds that are secured by revenues weren't really impacted. And that really took hold with them. So I, I, from my perspective, uh, that's kind of some of what we see in that. I have a question on those, on those decline in the, or being flat on the two-year schools in Texas. Was there, was there a difference between the rural and urban schools, or was it basically the same the whole state? The, generally speaking, the rural schools are shrinking faster, and the growth, when it happens, is happening in the metro areas. That's the general trend. There are exceptions on both sides. And, and one of the reasons is the big metros, they're now crossing the boundaries, which they agreed for many years they wouldn't cross. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. Gulf Coast big schools are doing dual credit in, in Alpine, Texas. So they're, they're reaching way across for free to make their numbers inflate. And this is, I think that margin thing that Jonathan just brought up is really, really crucial. We could go back to that car dealer uh, analogy again. You know, the margin and the, on a Suburban is giant. Those dealers make a ton of money on a Suburban. But you look at, you know, a Ford Focus, and the margin and, and the actual contribution margin on those cars is tiny, tiny, tiny. If all we cared about was the number of units we pushed across the line, we're going to sell may, way more units of the Ford Fiesta or the Ford Focus or whatever than we are of those Suburbans. And what Jonathan's talking about is we're actually growing our Suburban sales and intentionally shrinking those low-end ones that in some cases lose us money. 
We gave away 900 students down in the valley recently to a, a nearby school because we were losing, what was it, $800,000 a year on, on those students? Some big number. Um, uh, so the students still got the teaching they want, but we were actually able to change a, quote, bottom line by shedding headcount. So um, that's why the, 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 the headcount number all by itself has to be joined with the other data in order to see the whole picture of where we're, what we're doing and why we're heading where we are. If, uh, what part of this equation does sorry uh, does this bring in with with the uh, uh, business leaders? You know, as far as business collaborations, you know that some businesses might say, "Hey, we need these guys to be recertified or certified for one uh, one reason or another." Uh, as far as the numbers, do do those come into any type of formula to be paid for or or are we losing money in that or how much is there growth on that or is that declining that generally is captured in our non-credit uh, workforce training efforts um, that we have Bob I don't mean to put you on the spot but you know better what your performance is than I do for this past year I know that that is an increasing trend but it comes to us in terms of revenue it comes to us in a different format than what we're and it's not going to show up in these sort of enrollment sort of reports it's it's in a different That's category a but yeah we do so uh, mr chairman if i could a couple of informational points and i'll wrap up my my piece to kind of bring us back to where our performance report is um, for the year um, a traditional paying student growth of 1%. What that resulted in, though, was a 5% increase in sem semester credit hours taken or our, 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 our sales units. Um, so a 1% growth in customers buying 5% more credit hours. And that additional credit hour drove our revenue an additional 10%. So while just looking purely at the headcount numbers, um, we're up slightly, call it flat, but the actual performance of that is much better than it than it was last fall. And that's the way we'll continue to refine our efforts going forward to look at enrollment to be sure that we're using those um, as our as our metrics in which we focus on. And two, as 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 Jeff mentioned, get out of the practice of what we have historically done, and that's give you a one enrollment term snapshot and try to give you a full year performance snapshot on enrollment because enrollment's not just fall term. It's the biggest term, but it's not just fall term. There's a lot of activities that happen in all of our other enrollment periods. And as we expand that and begin to be more creative with how we do those entry points and exit points and enrollment terms, that's even going to be more important that we give you a full annual uh, performance score report if you will than just for the fall so thank you very much for the for the time i'm happy to try to answer any more questions that you that you might have thank you very much if i could i'd like to add this one more comment thank you rob thank great you. job um i hope nothing we said here left anybody with the impression that we're trying to offer you excuses as to why we're not doing 17 percent every single year um, but instead explain to you how we're very intentionally beginning to manage these things for the overall benefit to the student and us. And mere headcount is not going to be the metric that it was without considering these other factors. So we will consistently bring all that to you. I will tell you, the last time I looked at the data, TSTC spends a greater percent of its budget on marketing than any two-year school in Texas. We cover an entire state. Everybody else has a county or two or three. We have armies of recruiters on the road calling on high schools all over the place. We have an advertising budget that's pretty rich, but we spend it really smart by making sure we don't use mass media that millennials don't read, like the newspaper. We don't use that. 
like billboards. Millennials don't view billboards. The studies are clear. So we are spending a ton of money on this effort and an extraordinary amount of manpower and energy. And we're trying to keep doing it smarter and smarter. But what we were trying to say is we aren't going to lurch this needle immediately. It'll There'll be some environmental things that are also going to constrain our ability to hit it. But we're going to keep plugging away. And if we get more money, we're going to spend more still on this effort because of all of the benefits those students get from what we do. So I sure hope you don't think we're not taking this really serious. We are. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, that has been our report from the Strategic Partnership, uh, Strategic Relationship Committee. I'd like to make one comment. I've been on this board for about 12 years, and we chased headcounts for many, many years. We even tried to stabilize it by coming up with some statistical charts to make it look like it was going in the right direction. And we did make it look good on paper, but whenever the economy changed we had those large dips and things like that that we couldn't control so statistically we were chasing the wrong animal so i agree with the approach that we have right now it, it really makes sense it didn't in the past and i guarantee i'm a witness to that one we had a rather lengthy report today but we had a lot of information we had to pass on and i think it has benefited our new uh, regents today so thank you all right thank you chairman hearn appreciate that and appreciate all the information it was very very worthwhile i think to have that discussion uh next committee uh for facilities i uh, call on chairman skinner uh, mr chairman thank you we had a meeting this morning we have four minute orders and two reports and at this time i'm going to ask ray free to give those Good afternoon. Afternoon. Thank you, sir. Um, our first minute order is found on page 40, minute order number 39-17. Um, this is to accept the chiller, uh, central chiller plant design and construction phase services at Texas State Technical College, Harlingen. I, I might just start off by saying that the, the facilities brings minute orders to the board for projects that are greater than a half a million dollars. And the board, we asked the board to approve the concept, the budget, and then accept the projects. We also bring leases and easements to the board. So when we bring minute orders to the board, normally that's what they're going to, uh, going to be about. Uh, this project is going to- I might also add, uh, uh, you, the board, have, according to uh, Texas Education Code, have the authorization to buy and sell real estate in the counties in which we have approved locations. That makes us, and we don't require any further permission from the legislature or anything else, and that, that makes us uh, rather special in the code in terms of your ability to manage your real estate. Um, this project will uh, complete in December of this year and uh, this minute order and the minute order following are both on the same project this is for the design the next minute order will be for the actual acceptance of the construction project uh, TSTC administration requests the Board of Regents approve this minute order as written are there questions if not, uh, the minute order number on page 41 is number 40-17. This is the Chiller Plant Project itself um, at Texas State Technical College Harlingen. Uh, not only is this Chiller Plant state-of-the-art is going to really make that, that campus uh, more efficient and effective, it is the last or only project on our critical deferred maintenance that will be satisfied by the completion of this project. That's important. Um, there's photos on page 42, 43, and 44. Uh, page 42 shows the million-gallon thermal storage tank. Uh, the next drawing is the pumps and the piping. It's motor control centers, all pretty impressive work. The last drawing shows the chillers. There's three chillers in this project. They're 500-ton chillers. Uh, there's capacity to add two future chillers. 
This, this shutter system will service 18 buildings. And right now, the low, present load is uh, 1,150 tons of the 1,500 tons that it was designed for. So we still have capacity. Um, are there any questions? Uh, if not, TSTC admin administration requests the board approve this minute order as written. The next minute order is found on page 45. Minute order 41 or 41-17 is for the HVAC replacement project in building 5S01 at Texas State Technical College, Marshall. And that's the largest building on the Marshall campus. Um, this project included both design and construction to replace the HVAC units, the ductwork, dampers, and control system to balance the system to deliver a uh, pleasing environment to the building. Uh, because of the age of the units at that uh, location, plus the running of the ductwork and the dampers and the control system that was installed, we were not able to do that before, um, prior to this project. And this project will be complete in January of 2018. Uh, TSTC administration requests the board approval, approve, uh, Board of Regents approve this minute order as written. Are there any questions? Uh, the next minute order found on page 47 is 42-17. This minute order is to grant an easement to the Trinity River Authority for the construction of a permanent sanitary sewer pipeline at Texas State Technical College in North Texas. Uh, this is requesting a 30-foot wide temporary and 30-foot wide uh, permanent easement along Lawrence Road. This easement will not adversely affect the college's present or future use of the property. There's a map on page 48 that shows the easement. You can see the blue is actually an existing city easement that they're now. The green is the permanent and the red is the construction easement they're requesting. Uh, there's a letter from legal counsel to the chancellor that says it's a good deal. And the Texas State Technical College Administration uh, requests the Board of Regents approve this minute order as written. Are there any questions? Yes, sir. Who are they? Um, In this case, they're a power company. They do electrical power. Yes, yeah. well, they do water and sewer, and they do some river control, don't they? And dams and so. Oh, okay. That's what yeah, I was looking for. for. All the, for. The, yeah. there, Brussels River Authority. They're within certain counties, municipalities, and they just happen to hit uh, Dallas and obviously. I, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I don't know whether it's going to be a pressure line or not. Uh, we've got the capacity on our master plan to service our sewer, but if it's a gravity flow, I would think that, yes, we would be able to tie into that with future construction. Any other questions? Yeah, I think, I'm not sure if the TRA is a public-private um, entity. That's a good question. I'm, I'm going to look it up after, after the meeting. <laughs> Yeah, they're, they're big. They do a lot of work in the Metroplex. Yeah, they're not a, they're not a flaky organization. All the rivers have them. Colorado River Authority, they, had, they manage everything. Yeah. Brussels. On page 51, uh, we have the major projects report. And normally I blow through this pretty fast. And then at the end, I show some progress photos. But I'm going to try to toggle back and forth on this this time, kind of for the good of everyone to kind of refresh those that don't remember the projects well or that this may be the first time that they're seeing them. So the first project is the renovation of building 20 PM, uh, the engineering center there at Harlingen. Uh, the project's under contract and being constructed right now. 
And if I can make this work, I'll show you a picture of it. Push the right arrow. Right. Oh, wait a minute. Maybe I turned it off. There we go. Okay, this is the uh, the, the uh, landscaping at that building. Uh, the, the building itself is an 88,000 square foot, started as a shell. We've already done two phases of construction. This is where I, we're completing the second phase that will be completed in August of 18. Um, and we'll bring a minute order before you to accept that project when it is complete. Um, by doing this construction, we're able to bring the uh, engineering tech from Building 200J and the chemical engineering technology program from Building 200A into this building. And the master plan was to move all the engineering courses into this building. Uh, of the 88,000, there'll still be a remaining 16,400 square foot of high bay and 5,200 square foot of low bay to be developed in the future. This just shows a little bit of the construction. You can see it's just a kind of a wide open warehouse. Um, they had to sulk at the floor and put in piers to support the superstructure that would support the second, second level of the project. Uh, if you go back to your projects list, project number two and three are the chiller plant projects that we've already discussed in the minute order. Um, you'll see in the column that says cost allocation that numbers are in red in fact on this report it's a it, this report will carry over every every meeting but any changes that are made are going to show up in red and those two red numbers just indicate uh, line item adjustments within the budget where we have owners contingency for third party testing and reserve and that kind of thing we may adjust the contractors and the architects our contract <laughs> Uh, actually, on that project, we had a savings on the engineering portion of 45000 We moved it to the project, and that was on a previous report, but at that time it was in red. Um, the next project is the Brazos Center in Fort Bend. That is the master plan. Uh, that project was actually accepted. The, the Brazos Center is the second building. Is that building right there? That building was complete and occupied in August of uh, this year. And through the construction of that, we were able to generate enough savings in buyout and in owner's reserve to develop a pole yard, bring another program to the site. And so that pole yard is, is constructed right here, the lineman program. That's what it looks like. So the lineman program is and uh, uh, Center Point Energy was uh, really interested in the development of that. And they donated and set all those poles for us there for our linemen. If you, uh, if you ever get an opportunity to go to that campus, go visit those linemen. They're an energized group. Uh, really, really an exciting program. <laughs> and this is an actual uh, the classroom and lab for that lineman building. And if you look through the, the door there, that's all shade structure so they can bring them in out of the sun and, and uh, work on pieces of equipment and things that, so it's not quite so hot. Um, this project was turned over to us yesterday. So we're ready to close out the Brazos Center now. And like I say, you've already approved the minute order that, that accepted that project or delegated the authority to accept that project to the chancellor. Uh, the next project is to replace the water and sewer infrastructure on the Waco campus. Um, this project is in progress, no action required at this time. If you look at that map, you'll see, uh, if you can see the dotted lines, the dotted lines are trenchless, the solid lines are, are open cut. Um, the sewer line is about four and a half miles, the water is about five miles. The sewer is green, the water is blue. Four and a half miles of pipes is not a lot if you're going along the interstate across an open field. <laughs> but when you're doing it around all the buildings, streets, other existing utilities, and you're short, short, running short runs, it can turn into a major project. Very challenging, and I know there's, we've had a few um, incidents where we've had to shut the water off and regain it. Everybody will be happy when we get through that one. The abandoned project. 
the next project is the Abilene ITC. Uh, this is the master plan. The first building is under construction right now. It's the uh, ITC building, about 57,000 square feet. Um, So this was exactly one month ago. This is the same picture today. So they've done all that in a month. The other interesting thing, I didn't point it out on uh, the Brazos project, but our frontage road exposure on this, this is Loop 322 on the east side of Abilene, gets a lot of traffic, so we've really got a good location. The Brazos Center, we're right on Southwest Freeway, uh, couldn't have got a better location. There's rendering. Oh, actually, these are some progress photos that, uh, of where we are just a few days ago at ground level. And then this is a rendering of the completed st structure. Uh, the next project is uh, the uh, wayfinding project. We've completed Three of these wayfinding monuments, this is our statewide monument. The first one was built with the Brazos project. This is in Fort Bend. The second one was built at Red Oak uh, in North Texas. It's a half scale because we just had the single building there. And the one at Abilene will be full scale. So on that project, you'll see in red that we put, uh, that we, um, I didn't actually put it on there. We took on the, let's go back to the Abilene project. There's a 45, $46,321 ad there. So we took the wayfinding project and built the sign on that project uh, for 46321 The other thing I'll point out is in the right-hand column where it says required approvals, uh, there's times when I, I, sh I show the uh, go, go to the first project, approved minute order amount, 3750 So that's what the board has approved. So as we continue to run this report, we can watch and make sure that we don't exceed our limit. We're allowed to go 10% over without reapproval by the board. And so you'll see several projects there that have increased slightly, uh, but they're all under the 10% cap. Are there any questions? That concludes our report. Thank you. Oh, that's it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ray. Great report. Okay. Thank you, Chairman Skinner. Um, moving on to the uh, committee for audit. Uh, Chairman Andarza, anything else from you? Uh, we have no minute orders at this time, so thank you. All right. Thank you, Chairman Andarza. I move on to uh, the Committee for Fiscal Affairs, and I call on uh, Chairman Hatchell. We thought as a fiscal affairs committee we'd offer the discount at, at Kohl's. <laughs> Saturday only. <laughs> okay, John. <laughs> it's, it's been nice working with everybody. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, our first minute order uh, is on uh, page 54. It's minute order 43-17C. Typically, our pricing-related actions are come to the board on an annual cycle in February. We have a couple exceptions in this meeting uh, because we're uh, adapting to things we see on the ground. But uh, generally, on an annual basis, you will see us bring tuition-related price changes, fee-related price changes at our February, February Board of Regents meeting. That kind of works in our cycle uh, so that as they build courses um, in, in our, our system and enroll students, begin enrolling students in that springtime, 
that, that, that those uh, decisions have already been made. So that's kind of how our uh, typical annual cycle works. This is an exception. Um, uh, minute 43-17 relates to our pricing for the housing on this Waco campus. Um, and we'll do a lot of discussion about uh, housing today and this uh, Waco campus housing uh, specifically. Um, but what we have observed is that um, our pricing is relatively low and we will be um, needing to reconsider our, our positioning. Um, and we have certain units that are being renovated actively. And so for those specific units, they're um, actually single family units and they're actually undergoing renovations. We believe we have quite a bit of room to incre incrementally increase our pricing. So that, that is what this is related to. Um, in addition, and we'll talk about it, there's things like uh, water and sewer rates that we're seeing increase and um, that, that is being absorbed by the college uh, historically and so we're reevaluating that but there's a lot of rationale for uh, go ahead go ahead and moving forward with some price increases the actual increases that um, that are reflected show up on page uh, 58 and these are what we call family housing units um, so generally yes they're single family uh, units and and you see that the um, uh, the different types of rate changes that are that are proposed so it, the administration does ask your approval for these rate changes that would be effective this spring 2018 semester. Moving on to uh, minute order 44-17 is on page 59 and it's related to pricing of uh, our meal plans. Um, not really pricing but how we structure our our meal, pay, meal plan statewide. This is a residual item from our merger. Um, we've historically taken very different approaches to how we uh, set up meal plans for students. And so if you look on page 60, on the top of that page, you would see a table that is our proposed statewide meal plan structure. And what's below that are three tables that show the difference historically. Um, and so we really like to, um, uh, for consistency uh, sake and because we believe this is uh, good business, move in this direction for a, with a statewide meal plan structure. Um, the, uh, anyway, uh, I think uh, we'll go into more detail in terms of the housing, oh, I'm sorry, the meal plans and the food, uh, food service operations and we'll probably, we'll get to un unpack the rationale for this even further in those reports. I think one thing I do want to point out on this, um, so shifting to a single uh, rate plan structure is one move towards consistency. The remaining step uh, that we believe uh, that, sh that should be considered is uh, our campuses in Waco and in Sweetwater have a mandated meal plan. Our campus in Harlingen does not. And uh, we, do, we do see a pretty significant impact in terms of how well we capture those captive sale, cap, that captive audience and those related sales. And so we'll share some information related with that operation here in a minute. I'll offer, I'll offer one other comment and that is the state rules or laws say that any fee that we charge to a student has to be expressly approved by the and so you will always see us bring sometimes a mountain of uh, information in terms of various fee structures and things like that. And it seems like an awful lot of detail, but we're obligated uh, to show that to you and for you to approve whatever uh, we charge a student. The last action item uh, is Minute Order 45-17. It's on page 61. And it is our policy for investments. Uh, Jason Mallory indicated in the audit committee uh, that uh, we are required to comply with the Public Funds Investment Act. One of the elements of that is to have the board adopt our investment policy on an annual basis. So you will see this every November uh, come before you. From last year to this year, there are no changes proposed in our investment policy. 
Um, and so we would just ask that you uh, approve this as as is. There, um, there is one provision uh, that I wanted to point out on page. Do it from memory. Um, for our uh, depository agreements, uh, specifically our operating accounts, uh, page 63, the very top, uh, we do have a requirement in our policy that I will uh, update our fiscal affairs committee uh, with the status of our depository agreements. Uh, at the fall meeting of our Board of Regents. We do that in our working committee sessions, and we actually did that today. I had uh, Vice President Chad Wooten provide an update on our recent merger of our operating accounts. I think previously we had something like 27 separate accounts and separate operating accounts, all with different fee structures. You had to consider um, moving to a different merchant account for credit cards, you would get to apply that 27 different ways. So for, for a lot of reasons beyond that, uh, it was good business for us to move to a, uh, a, a statewide single operating account and we're very pleased with uh, how that process went. We actually went through uh, a request for proposal process. We had uh, five members of our team uh, evaluate that and it was ultimately award, awarded to First National Bank of Central Texas uh, after a, a very competitive uh, bid process and um, um, they, they won out. They really uh, offered a very competitive bid. So we were uh, pleased to see that happen this year. It's going to be um, good for streamlining our business. Okay, that concludes the uh, action items. Uh, on the report, the um, remaining portion of the Fiscal Affairs Committee is uh, in reports. Um, and I'm, I actually have a uh, presentation for the first three reports that we're offering. So historically, in November, we have just closed the books on our previous financial year. Um, and you'll see that in our uh, annual um, our annual budget to actual information in, in further reports. But one of the things we typically do is off, also offer um, a, a, an overview of what happened with what we call our auxiliary operations. So pages 71, 70, 71, and 72 offer, offer that for our uh, bookstores, our cafes, and our housing operations. And uh, for two reasons, I, we wanted to go into a little bit more depth than we've really historically done. Number one, we have new regents and we wanted to um, provide some context about sort of uh, what these are and, and kind of what we expect from them. I actually did send some, uh, our annual budget report to the new regents with a cover letter kind of expressing we had talked about our profit centers in our previous meeting and, um, and so uh, did a little bit of catch up there. But then in addition, if you look at those reports on pages 70, 71, and 72, those are, you know, the operating trends, the, the financial trends on those are in some cases moving in a negative direction. They're not where we want them to be essentially. And so we thought it'd be very appropriate for us to go through this in a little bit more depth uh, at, at this meeting. So auxiliary enterprises. I want to introduce uh, Kevin Dorton is in the back of the room. Uh, he's our Associate Vice Chancellor for Auxiliary Enterprises. Uh, so he oversees all of these operations. He may interject uh, as, as I speak incorrectly or as he adds context. Uh, so I wanted you to know who's talking if he does that. Um, so we have basically what we call our retail operations, our food, which, which are food service, our cafes, um, and our bookstores. And then we have um, our housing operations, and then we have our airport operations. Traditionally, we cover the first two, the retail and the housing, uh, this time of year. So in this budget report, we talked about how these, all of these operations are really in a turnaround mode. And um, when we took these on a couple of years ago, there were just some uh, historical issues 
uh, that, that needed, needed to be addressed from either a, a management perspective, how we manage them, or a quality of the assets that we were taking on. And so uh, we expressed that at, at the last meeting. And one of the things I wanted to point out is, oh, my underlining is gone, but um, basically I want to stress that it is not an overnight proposition, that uh, we are still um, you know, unpacking what, is, what it is in this asset that, that we've taken on. And so um, anyway, I want to just reiterate that. Uh, this is actually the table where we uh, uh, forecasted the financial performance of all of our profit centers for the next five years. And specifically, we, um, we did highlight that the auxiliary operations were going to uh, project a loss for this year. And uh, we were pretty close in terms of what our projections were. And, uh, and so we talked about, uh, the, uh, talked about the auxiliaries generally, but it was within the context of a number of profit centers, our classic college, our C4EO, um, and so we didn't probably get to go, we didn't get to go into a real high level of fidelity, and so we thought this would be good to do today. Uh, but uh, as, as you'll remember, um, these are, uh, our, our, our greatest hope for these is probably going to be, ha to have a margin between the, in the single digits generally. And so these are, um, <laughs> And so, the, and so the auxiliary enterprises is essentially a portfolio that we are managing. Um, like with the rest of our profit centers, we're evaluating risk and return over time as we, as we evaluate this. Um, so campus stores. I want to emphasize the word campus. Um, we've, you'll see even in the reports, we, we've historically referred to these as bookstores. But the, we're going to see a pivot. We've actually seen a pivot over the last few years. Um, we actually have campus stores at four of our locations, Marshall, Harlingen, Waco, Sweetwater. But we actually have six uh, areas identified here. We actually uh, anticipate Fort Bend and North Texas taking on an additional role in terms of our, our campus store impact. and more more specifically, we think there's going to be real opportunity uh, in the dual credit areas for us to actually realize new revenues through those dual credit contracts and working for some exclusivity language as we partner with those institutions. So it's more, there's more revenue potential in some of these projects beyond just tuition than as we look at um, instructional programs and, and the different ways their students bring revenues to us. Auxiliaries can have a significant impact in, in what the total value of a student is uh, to TSDC. So the financial results, this is the bookstore results. Um, you've got this on page 70 of your report. I thought it would be helpful to just dive in and look specifically at what some of the sales trends are. So um, what we're seeing over the last five years is total sales are down in the bookstores about $650,000. You look, if you look at the categories of items, books are actually down a million dollars. So we're actually uh, compensating uh, for the loss in, in book sales by sales of different types of merchandise, clothes, food, uh, different things like that. And that's really why you're seeing the, the shift to campus store. Um, you know, in the book sales category, our sales force is actually our instructional area. Right? It's the stu the, as the instructors develop their curriculum, they determine what text they'll use in the classroom. And, and so a close coordination is required to manage this efficiently and effectively. Um, we actually saw in the last couple of years there's a movement in some of our locations to go to lower cost uh, materials. I think it's uh, in Texas it's the open, uh, Adam, what is it? Open educational resources. So there's uh, a movement to to adopt these open uh, open educational resources as as a, as a way to lower the educational cost of students. Because um, we've all, I think, a lot of us have paid for that three hundred dollar, four hundred dollar textbook, and and can relate. I mean, we're sensitive to that. Um, we've seen so. Uh, we historically had a, a freshman level textbook that every every freshman had to take. 
Um, and that was a three-hour course. It had a, a, a textbook that was associated with it. So you can imagine every freshman comes in, buys a textbook, and you eliminate that requirement has a significant impact on, on your sales of, of your campus stores. So these are... Um, John, I, can I yes, ask sir. a question? For the dual credit classes, who pays for, who takes on the cost of the, uh, the textbooks? I think it varies. So what we have, what we have seen as we've consolidated dual credit, each of those uh, MOUs, each of those partnerships, were structured very differently. In the last year, they've moved to um, consolidate those practices, make consistent those practices, and we're, we're shifting to um, um, a, a requirement of the school district picking up the cost of those educational resources. Yeah. And I think that's a great real opportunity for us if if we do see some if we do see that as a viable op, you know growth area for us and we go into a high density school districts that have a, a, a larger growth plan that stream of revenue could be uh, um, po real positive for us and in that case you wouldn't have the overhead of a campus store you would you would act more like a distribution center mm -hmm. Um, and then lastly, the, um, the coordinating board uh, uh, during the last few years shifted from a, a seven or a mandated that institutions move from a 72 hour uh, curriculum to a 60 hour curriculum. And so for a student getting an associate's degree, uh, they're going to take 16% less courses and that correlates into 16% less books. These are um, all uh, what my boss tends to say. Are, these are not our fault, but these are our problem. <laughs> and so uh, these are something we're wrestling with. And one of the ways that we're um, uh, addressing this is through looking at the different product types that move beyond book sales in these campus stores. But that, that is really a lot of the explanation in terms of what's occurring on the revenue line. In terms of expense trends, uh, I think you saw in the last year there's a negative 3% contribution margin. Um, and, and so actually one of the things that uh, we observed when we merged the campuses and we began to go to the campus sites and assess what is it we have at these campus stores, we found a lot of inventory that hadn't moved in a long time. And for, really it was book inventory. Um, we actually had $610,000 of inventory. We've been writing that off on a three-year uh, phase-in process, and so that has impacted our our margins the last couple of years. Uh, we've actually added some accounting personnel uh, to really help us unpack what it, you know, what is it we have there. And they've actually also done some additional truing up of our inventory that caused an additional $150,000 write-off this year as we reconciled uh, uh, inventories at one of our campuses. And then we've had some increased labor costs. We actually had some prolonged uh, um, sick leave situations where we had to add uh, additional FTE uh, and so we're uh, double dipping there in terms of compensation costs and then um, as as we're aware we've had uh, a compensation philosophy that we've adopted with mandated compensation adjustments over the last few years and the employees enjoy that that makes us a great place to work but on the P&L side um, there is a, a real cost uh, to that so that's kind of what we're seeing there in terms of increased costs. From an outlook perspective, it really, I really believe our pre-mergers are, are nearly behind us. We'll have one more year of write-offs on that three-year write-off plan. Um, we're seeing a really increased competency in, in the concepts of inventory turns, um, those sort of retail management uh, principles. You know, we just, we didn't have, we had different levels of development in terms of how well we operate our bookstores. Um, when Greg Gercio, the gentleman that leads our retail operations, headed this up, the systems weren't all that sophisticated. He was manually calculating inventory turns every month for every campus, sending it out, you know, asking them to respond to that. Um, we've actually, our systems now produce inventory turn by category and, you know, it's uh, in a much more elegant uh, distribution of that and it's you know it's a, it's a new scorecard for them to run that business on. Um, 
we our, our partnership with our sales force with the instructional group has really come a long way in the last couple of years i think it can come much further um, not only can we work with them in ter terms of directing students towards our our campus stores uh, and, and capturing that converting those sales um, but even on when we don't sell the books if we have a good dialogue with them our write downs can come down significantly uh, we, if, if we know we're not going to use textbooks, publishers generally will, will give us credit if we send them back. And so um, just by improving those practices, we can increase our bottom line. Uh, and then um, in, in terms of addressing those costs of educational resources, there's other things we're doing. Uh, we actually have um, the capability now that if a student uh, chooses Amazon, I mean, yeah, Amazon as, as the provider, they can actually uh, navigate there through our bookstore and we will actually get um, credit for that. And so um, there's, um, I'm beeping, it's just the whole Fiscal Affairs Committee. All right, um, rental books is an opportunity for us and then a real opportunity is cu uh, custom books. So I think a frustrating thing for all of us when we bought that $400 textbook and it, it had 24 chapters and we only had to use four of them, that, that was a source of frustration. We actually had the ability to work with pub publishers and uh, use a select portion of that text, create uh, a product that Amazon can't compete with, uh, but that's at a, at a lower cost to our student. And so we have, you know, innovations like that. Um, so I think that our expectations about a shift to profitability are reasonable. That's our campus stores, food service. Uh, food service is a little more troubling. If you look at that uh, uh, five-year report, I'll just jump right to it. Um, you know, we see a, a, a long-term trend and um, there's more material uh, changes, I think, required in this division than probably some of the others. From a sales perspective, you know, this is definitely tied to our uh, trends in enrollment. And so, um, you know, fewer students uh, means fewer opportunities to sell to them. You can overcome that through, through different um, channels. But in Harlingen, um, it's, it's, so we have three food service operations. One's in Waco, one in Har one's in Harlingen, one's in Sweetwater. Well, in terms of a food service operation, location really matters. Um, Harlingen is uh, largely a commuter campus. The competition, the opportunity for stu uh, students to go to get another option is right next door. Um, and, and so that's a different kind of challenge. It's not near as residential as say Waco is. Um, Sweetwater is out away from the competition. Very captive audience. Got a high percentage of students that are residential. And so on an annual basis, we're going to collect many more dollars per student in Sweetwater than we are at the other campuses. Waco is about 30% residential. Uh, we have a mandated meal plan uh, in Waco. And so we convert many, more, you know, many more dollars in Waco per student than, than say in Harlingen. So that's kind of what's happening here. This is Harlingen. Harlingen's, um, you know, seen uh, a drop off in terms of their sales. Part of that's enrollment related. Part, part of it is we're just not getting enough of, their, of, of the business in the marketplace. Uh, we also did see in the last two years a loss of grant revenue. And that impacted both our housing and our food service in Harlingen. Uh, um, we actually have had some grants that were directed at uh, students that would actually, uh, the grant would support them being housed and it would pay for, for their meals. And so uh, that's had a pretty significant impact specifically on the Harlingen area. And we've had an opportunity to work with our sponsored uh, programs, the, the folks that write grants, and, and they have a, they they recognize the impact even on the on the um, the profit side. So, so Sweetwater, uh, you can see uh, they, and it's interesting the footprint of you can imagine uh, Sweetwater is a much smaller campus, many much fewer students in terms of enrollment, but their total sales at their cafe is about the same as what Harlingen is. Um, we see we've seen some movement in terms of the enrollment. Uh, some of that's related to cleaning up data. We're getting better about identifying 
which students that are, are at a particular campus in West Texas. They've historically done a lot of collaboration. And so, um, so I, I'm a little sketchy on these um, enrollment numbers. But generally, uh, we, we've had a pretty good, uh, we've been able to retain a lot of sales. It's something like $936 per year per student that they spend at our cafe there. It's something like $250 per student in, Har in Waco, and it's something like $96 in Harlingen. Kind of tells you the difference. Um, this is Waco. So Waco's had a um, you know slow uh, decrease in uh, enrollment over the last five years, and so uh, we've been able to sort of salvage that through new partnerships with the local campus. We actually through through the Waco campus, we do much more catering on this campus than at the other locations. So those are opportunities that we can share best practices across the state. From a cost trend, our cost of goods sold. We have we had a problem in Harlingen. We weren't pricing uh, our, our you know our prices were not were not correct. And so if you actually looked at the meal plan structure that I put in front of you, and it actually had meal plans that structured 70 meals for this price. Those those prices per meal were not sufficient to cover cost and labor. And that's that's a recipe for disaster. So that's part of what we're seeing. And we have some opportunities to fix that through pricing, labor costs. We have some right sizing to do in terms of the operational footprints. What's what's the demand for for our, our food services, and and what you know are we are we have we built a church for Easter Sunday? Uh, we might have a little bit in terms of the uh, cafes in in Sweetwater and, and in Harlington, um, and then we do have some re, uh, non-recurring costs that are showing up in that last year. Uh, specifically here in Waco, we play, replaced a freezer. Uh, that's necessary, and um, we actually did renovate the cafe, uh, we've, which we've actually seen a, a pretty significant increase in terms of people dining in our cafe as a result. Outlook, I think I mentioned it earlier on the minute order. Um, the meal meal plans, mandating meal plan in Harlingen, might might really help us salvage our. Uh, food service operation doing a better job of cap capturing that captive audience. You have more students um, in in dorms in Harlingen than you have in Sweetwater, um, and I, uh, most every one of those students in Sweetwater is, has a meal plan. Uh, last year we had three Harlingen students sign up for a meal plan. So um, uh, increased metrics. I think uh, measuring the the, the cafes on. You know, average tickets, the number of guests, meal plan usage, uh, I think is, is going to help us move move the needle. And then, um, but ultimately, you know, I think right sizing, uh, right sizing the operation. That's food service. And then lastly is housing. And housing really is the most significant profit center in the auxiliary uh, umbrella. So um, if you look at that, you can see the green is Waco. So it's sort of the green monster in terms of um, its girth and, and the size of that uh, portfolio. Um, the financial results this year uh, are, were up in terms of total revenue, and um, but uh, we've got some unusual uh, cost activities this fiscal year. So I'll go through the sales trends again. So this is um, uh, an enrollment and revenue uh, dynamic uh, here. Uh, down in Harlingen, you know, enrollment over the last five years has been down, um, but uh, we've actually been able to um, 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 manage in terms of uh, occupancy. We did see uh, occupancy go down with respect to those grants again that we lost that that paid for uh, uh, the housing for several students. Um, in Marshall, uh, enrollment. It, uh, has been down. Our revenue has been down more. Uh, uh, we've noticed a slip in occupancy trend. And what I'll actually say about um, all of our housing units is, and I mentioned it at the beginning, um, for decades there was uh, deferred maintenance that occurred that we're playing catch up on. And um, we're working uh, really hard to improve the asset quality. 
uh, and I'll, I'll, you'll see a real specific example of that. But even the furnishings inside the units, um, they, they make a big uh, difference in terms of the appeal of the units. I think we're going to see we have some new opportunities that came about to, to make those more marketable. Um, Waco, uh, in, while, although en enrollment has been down over the last five years, uh, our revenue has been up. Um, we've actually uh, brought more units online uh, through a very active program uh, focused on maintaining and, and turning over uh, the units uh, uh, that are in that single family housing portfolio. Um, the Brazos community is that single housing portfolio. Uh, the number of units that are available to us are up by about 4%. Um, and our occupancy range for that portfolio is in the 87 to 90% range. And if we could keep them turning, if we could turn them over as, you know, immediately, those numbers would probably be even higher. Uh, we have, because we actually have a waiting list for these actual units. Uh, Red River and Lavaca are more dorm style or apartment style units. And uh, those have a, a very high occupancy level. I think our big, uh, competitive point on those is pricing. Frankly, we have, we're have we very low relative to market. Um, but despite the um, asset condition, the, the condition of those assets, um, we actually have gotten feedback uh, from uh, our, our consultant that indicates we have a high level of satisfaction with from the students that are actually uh, uh, renting those units. So Waco, yeah, Waco housing is our most specific, most significant. Um, it's a mix of uh, student and family housing. Um, I, I mentioned the significant deferred maintenance. So for for the new regents, um, in May we submitted a proposal uh, to have a consulting group conduct a uh, marketability and financial feasibility study for really evaluating uh, what is it, what is this asset that we have and what is its potential. Uh, the board did approve that. Uh, we began the process of uh, uh, entertaining bids from different consultants. Uh, we've got two members of, of the Board of Regents that are participating uh, in that with us, uh, Regent Hatchell, Regent Skinner. And uh, we've had two meetings so far uh, with, with the consulting group. And I think it's been very fruitful. I think there's a, a lot of, uh, we're, we're eager to see what their final recommendation is. And I believe between now and the next board meeting, we'll actually have uh, something of a, of a proposal for what is the long-term direction for this Waco housing portfolio, this most significant portfolio that we have. <coughs> Sweetwater, uh, so Sweetwater and Marshall, are our two housing uh, uh, portfolios that have uh, an oversupply situation. And so we run about 50% occupancy both in Marshall and in, and in Sweetwater. That's um, um, a situation that we continue to try to think strategically about. And in some cases, uh, we're looking at strategic repurposing of some of those uh, facilities uh, um, as, as we run out of space in places like Marshall. Um, for, for other type spaces. Um, on the expense trend uh, category, so we're seeing um, increased make ready efficiency. And so what I mean by that is that as we turn over housing units, our cost per um, um, uh, make ready unit ha has uh, gone down significantly. Our timing of flipping those has gone uh, down gone down uh, significantly. Um, we have seen, as I mentioned, increased uh, water and sewage rates. I think in Waco we had 33% uh, increase over the last year in terms of water and 100% increase in terms of sewage. And we're not really seeing that uh, be passed on um, because we, we bear the burden of that. Those, aren't, those specific utilities aren't metered. Um, and we've had some, so uh, I just I want to emphasize this point. On the make readies, this is a historical um, break, uh, historical summary of what we saw happen with the single family units here in Waco. So over about a 15 year period, 
we lost a significant portion of that portfolio because of that deferred maintenance. When we've been able to stem that for the last three or four years and have avoided the required demolition of those. The, the demolition of those, you might, if you look at them, you might think, hey, that's a, a, a viable alternative for them. But every time we do that, it's about a $30,000 cost because they're, they contain asbestos and have to be abated. So part of what is being evaluated by the uh, consultant is, is factoring that in, you know, is, is raising them or replacing them with new, uh, a good alternative. Well, if you do, your sunk cost consideration in that is $30,000. So perhaps renovating uh, is a more financially lucrative uh, opportunity, but as you evaluate that and evaluate investing in a significant number of units, are you going to have the market demand for those cash flow sufficiently? And that's, um, that's really the next phase of their, their research. I mentioned uh, utilities already. Um, we had some a unique non-recurring maintenance this last year. We actually had a roof blow off one of our dorms um, that just exceeded our deductible with our <laughs> insurance. So it was about $125,000 expense. We had some mold remediation uh, required actually replacing uh, AC units and that was pretty significant one time uh, cost. We had uh, a laundry facility that you wouldn't wash your clothes in and so uh, we felt like that was absolutely necessary that we actually renovate that and uh, make that a more um, uh, useful asset for us uh, and that's actually a public private deal we actually outsource that and get a, a, re a royalty off of the revenues from that uh, operation but we did have to uh, contribute some capital costs up front um, we've done some uh, renovations uh, to one of our uh, apartment style units, Red River here. Um, and then uh, we actually have had some fire marshal uh, um, issues that have come up this, this last year that again there's some historical issues related to fire marshal compliance um, and, and we're, um, we're now getting to uh, address some of those. The biggest cost, fire marshal cost related item relates to windows and uh, the, the egress the, the size of the opening of the window must meet a certain uh, requirement in um, it's pretty pretty significant co significant cost to go in and do those replacements uh, the fire marshal's been very um, um, urgent about us uh, fit, correcting those issues but also understanding about our resource limitations and this potential project coming up um, so for example, on our wood frame units that we have on this campus, um, it's gonna it's gonna it would cost something like six hundred thousand dollars to replace the windows that are required to to get into compliance. So what we ask them is, can we wait and not lose the value of that, um, and actually do that during the process of our renovation? So we don't so so because the solution that they proposed would those windows would not be viable into the into the renovation. They have been uh, agreeable to that, um, so we're focusing on what we can fix, and that still has a pretty hefty price tag, um, but we have uh, a targeted plan, but that will impact our bottom line for, for housing this next year. Um, I think, um, so the, the housing study is, um, I think, a, a really big opportunity for us. I'm really eager to see what, what what the outside consultant, you know, validates or invalidates in terms of what our expectations are. Um, we have a partnership with um, a complex on this campus. It's uh, with a company called Campus Living Villages, or uh, the, the actual unit's called Village Oaks. And uh, in the last few years, they have made a significant um, um, capital investment in their uh, in their units um, and as a part of that we actually renegotiated our contract um, we were we were they that we deferred our royalty which we historically didn't get uh, but we renegotiated re re better terms uh, with them we anticipate uh, in the next two years to start really seeing that uh, bear fruit but uh, I don't that wouldn't have been possible I don't believe without some um, significant relationship management that has gone on with them and some other fruit that ha has been born out of that is we actually had them donate 
a significant amount of furniture uh, that was very slightly used. They actually uh, had a uh, relationship with IKEA that just with IKEA that just formed, and so they had to replace all their furniture, and so a lot of it was barely used, barely, almost new. We're able. That's about a three hundred uh, three quarters of a million dollar um, gift that uh, we are going to get to, and it's actually making a pretty big difference in terms of the marketability of some of our units. So in some cases, we're actually material, you know, get, uh, having value materialized just out of a uh, good, good relationship with our partner there. Um, so that's my report on housing, I mean, on, on the auxiliaries. I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you for uh, letting me address it. We've got to do that. But at the same time, we don't want to lose a mission of our, our duty here, and that's to provide a quality skill education and affordable cost to our student. So we're going to be trying to balance both of those. Mr. Chairman, that's the end of our report. I, I actually I do have a few more reports. I apologize. Okay. Yes, sir. <laughs> That was just the first one. That was the first one. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll, I will go quickly. Page page seventy three is um, our quarterly report um, on budget to actual expenditures. Um, this is actually the year in review, and so seventy three, seventy four, and seventy five will provide that information. So uh, page seventy three is uh, a large overview. Uh, you'll see that in uh, most of the categories, we have pretty significant amounts of, of budget remaining as we actually had revenues uh, materialize, the budget adjusted. Um, and so as you see that the, that budget wasn't used, we actually saw last year a um, uh, capture of that margin or reserve from year to year. Um, on, on page 74, it's the same information but broken out between salaries and operating costs. The top bar on, um, on the education and general funds, um, we did have a, a, an overage in terms of salaries and benefits. What actually occurred there was uh, as the, they closed the books and accru uh, accrued uh, leave expense, uh, and then as we got our bill from ERS for our group insurance, we actually had uh, uh, expenditures that weren't accounted for in budget or over what we accounted for in budget, and that's actually where you saw those uh, overages. Uh, we had similar things occur in, in the auxiliary funds uh, a little bit further down. Um, and then on page 75, we actually uh, show the change in the budget over the year and uh, and so we, we pro try to provide that tr in a transparent way on page 75. But as I stated, we, we actually were able to um, have a, a, pr a pretty substantial relative to the last few years amount of budget remaining last year. Some of that actually had to lapse back to the state. The governor imposed a hiring freeze uh, mid-year last year um, in August. Uh, they indicated that they in anticipate that some of that should lapse back and so I think it was something like 1.2 million dollars actually lapsed uh, of our of our appropriation on page 76 is a qu quarterly report we are required to stay within uh, a threshold of full-time equivalent employees that are paid with appropriated dollars and so that's actually what, what you see uh, being reported on page 76. So uh, across the board, we're under the threshold. Uh, um, you get, see it on a statewide basis on the right of your chart that are statewide. Uh, and ENG stands for Education and General Funding. That's a category of funding uh, that is um, state support. And so we're within our, uh, within our threshold of, of allowable employees. Uh, it was mentioned earlier uh, that we actually saw compression of our total uh, headcount of employees. Page 77 actually shows that. Uh, it shows you a five-year uh, trend in terms of our overall full-time equivalent employees. We're actually 58 employer, employees 
um, smaller than we were five years ago. And, um, and if we break it down between appropriated uh, dollars and other dollars that, that fund that. The trend in terms of increasing appropriated dollars relates to the state directly funds our startup locations with a, a line item of funding called startup funding. And so there are more of those types of dollars that are funding the employees on those campuses. So you see that shift occur over those five years. Page 78 also shows more on that trend information. And so when we talk about new locations popping up and the related uh, FTE growth related to those, you see Fort Bend um, has 63 employees that didn't exist back in 2013. Um, North Texas has 41 employees that didn't exist uh, five years ago. And EWC stands for East Williamson County. It's our multi-institutional teaching center down in uh, Hutto, Texas. And um, it has 24 employees that didn't exist five years ago. So that growth uh, was achieved uh, by, by streamlining at some of our more dense uh, campuses, uh, our dense headcount uh, uh, campuses. And so you see at the top, Waco, Harlingen, um, all compressed in terms of their FTE counts over that five-year period. Page 79 is our pledge collateral report. In that investment policy that we addressed earlier, uh, it describes the requirement of collateral uh, for our investments. And so this is a summary of the different uh, depository institutions and the required collateral. Required collateral. We actually did have uh, an insufficient collateral situation. Uh, the second to last, or line 17, um, that was recognized within days and uh, addressed uh, promptly uh, in accordance with our uh, investment policy. Page 80, 81, and 82 list our different inv investments as required under the PFIA. We actually provide a, a weighted average rate of interest to um, give an indication of, of what our earnings were. Uh, we had a whopping 0.96% weighted average of interest last year, um, or last quarter, and our uh, weighted average maturity, I'm sorry, our, our benchmark against that was about 1.23%. So we've actually been able to get, um, that's actually pretty competitive <laughs> at that 1% 1, 1 uh, performance. And there's one final report, Chairman. <laughs> it's our uh, uh, semi-annual report certifying debt management. Uh, um, and so we began reporting this last February after we implemented a debt management policy a year ago. And so page 83 is an attestation with respect to our compliance with, that, with our debt management policy. Some supporting documentation behind that is information about our debt service and, and details that uh, by the different type of uh, instrument. On page, and that's on page 84. I think uh, um, the, the pie chart on the top of page 84 is interesting when you think about how do we pay for debt service as an institution. Um, so in the blue category, those are, uh, that's debt service that the state has appropriated dollars to cover the debt service. Chancellor refers to that sometimes as, you know, like the, the loan, you know, that's co-signed by the, by the debt. Dad. Yeah, and dad's dad putting the, the bill. Yeah, and dad makes the payments <laughs> contractually, yeah. Um, so, so in terms of identifying funds from operations to cover debt service, that's not required of that. There's a guaranteed um, um, revenue source for that. The gray category actually relates to our debt service at our East Williamson County Higher Education Center. That's a partnership with um, the community down there, uh, specifically related to the facility. Um, the uh, Hutto ISD, the City of Hutto Economic Development Center, um, and Temple College all contribute to the debt service to the tune of a million dollars a year. Um, and they'll do that through um, the length of, the, the, of that note. 
And then the remaining $7.6 million is debt service that is uh, required from operations. A pretty significant portion of that is short term. Um, that uh, about two thirds of the way down, there's a line item that says Te Texas Public Finance Authority lease purchases. Um, that's $2.9 million a year. That's largely used to fund equipment and in, in, in large part used to fund equipment at our startup locations where we have startup funding. So um, there, you know, there is some uh, coverage of that from appropriations. And then last on the last uh, two pages, we have the listing of the different types of debt instruments uh, that, that we owe on. Um, about halfway down is, a, is a, a note we have with the TSDC Foundation for our housing in Marshall. I believe that was asked about at our last, our, our last Regent meeting. It's about $1.4 million and will come, uh, will mature on October 2023. Um, so that's that's offered to the board. And then lastly is information on our debt rate, our bond ratings on page 86. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So um, the highlighted portion above indicates the different uh, rating agencies that rate our bonds, what their actual rating is. And at the bottom, there's um, verbiage that says Moody's negative, S&P negative, and Fitch stable. And so what that means is as the rating agencies evaluate your bonds and, and they, they qualify the rating that you are currently at, and so, so two of them <clears throat> say there are some factors that are causing us to have a negative, uh, negative outlook on this institution. And, and in our case, it looked like when they looked at this two years ago, um, we had uh, uh, budgets that um, re uh, expenses exceeded revenues. We had enrollment um, declines. We had new locations. We had um, a new funding formula. And so all of those things were cited as um, uncertainties that caused them to have a negative outlook. Well, we had, um, revenues exceed expenses the last couple of years. We've had enrollment increases the last couple of years. Our uh, new locations are growing. Um, we haven't had a decline in our appropriation, um, but, you know, it's, but it's new, so that I don't know that they'll let us off the hook. But So I, I think there's some reason to think that some of that pressure may, may come off. So um, S&P, uh, I just had a meeting with them this week. They will uh, give me their draft report two weeks from Wednesday, and um, they will publish the report the day or two after that. And then I, I believe Moody's is going to be in early December, and Fitch has not communicated with us yet. And, and they may not because they're stable, and when they have a stable outlook, sometimes they skip years in terms of doing a surveillance call. Thank you. Yes, sir. Does that complete your report? <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you very much. Yeah. Mr. Chairman. We <laughs> have those three uh, minute orders. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Chairman Hatch. Uh, at this time, uh, any committee chair can move from the, uh, any item from the consent agenda to new business. Is there anyone who'd like to move any item to the New business from the consent agenda. Any chairman? All right, hearing none. Uh, the consent agenda is before you. I will entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Got a motion by Regent Skinner. Second. Second by Regent Greggy. Any discussion? Questions? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Okay, all right, so noted. <clears throat> okay, uh, moving on to uh, unfinished business. Uh, is there any unfinished business? Yes, we do have one. We have one report from Hannah. Thank you, Regent Hearn. 
For those of you who are new, I'm Hannah Love, the Associate Vice Chancellor for Human Resources, and I have the opportunity today to speak with you about the survey of employee engagement. 2017 is the second time that TSTC participated in the survey of employee engagement from the Institute of Organizational Excellence at the University of Texas at Austin. This year's result provided the college an opportunity to benchmark our results from 2016. It's the second time as a statewide college that we have participated in this survey. It's the climate survey that we do with our employees across the state in order to measure employee engagement. In this year's survey, we had 74% participation across the state. The data was collected in the month of June by employees at all 10 locations, and we had a 19.5% increase in this year's results from last year. That is an exceptional increase for any institution to experience. Our vendor, when they provided the results back to us, said not only is this atypical for any college, they haven't really seen that amount of an increase for an institution who has gone through their particular survey result in any one 12-month period of time. 74% of any employee group responding to an engagement instrument is in and of itself a marker of those employees being highly engaged with their college. In the prior year, only 55% of our employees participated across the board. So we were very pleased overall. What we saw in this particular year as well is that 61% of our employees were highly or moderately engaged when they answered this particular survey. And 26% were engaged with the institution. One of the things to know as you listen to the results of this survey is any score at 350 or above is considered desirable by this particular vendor. So as you look at the results that will go through throughout this survey, when you see a 350 mark, you know that we're very pleased with that as a college. In this year's result, our overall score was at a 372. That was up two points from last year's survey result. One of the other things that we look at when we have a response in this kind of survey is did we have a good balance in the individuals who responded to the survey. This particular survey response was highly balanced. We had a good representation of the years of service and the age of the employees who responded. We had 415 of our faculty members who responded this year. That was up 55 from last year. We had 813 staff members who responded this year, up 245 from the previous year. So we were very pleased overall with that as well. Now, as you look at this particular slide, we've got a lot of data that we're going to be going through. I'm going to remind you, anything above a 350 is a positive score and marks the tipping point in a positive perception of an employee's engagement with the college. So as we look at data, it can get like, it seems like it's very complicated. There's really only two things on this slide overall you need to be looking at, is the score above 350 and the arrows on the far right of the screen. Do you have a red or a blue arrow? Is it going up or down? The red or the blue arrows are telling you our benchmark score with our 2016 survey response. So if you see that we went up, that's going to be positive. If we went down, that's going to be a negative for the college overall. In nine of 12 of the construct scores, we had a positive result for this year. So overall, that's something that we're very pleased about as a college. 
only two of our scores are below the 350 mark that is the positive tipping point for the organization that we're looking for. And in those two areas that are below 350, it's pay and internal communication that see those marks. We saw our greatest improvement actually in one of our most negative scores. Pay is one of those, and the other greatest improvement we saw was in our strategic score this past year. What this survey breaks down for the college next is what are our overall strengths and weaknesses. Each survey vendor that does employee engagement, and there's a lot of them out there in the industry, has a particular way of telling a college what are their strengths and weaknesses. For the Institute for Organizational Excellence, the way that they do it is whatever your top three scores and your bottom three scores, those are your strengths and weaknesses. It wouldn't matter if we had a 400, which is like an A plus on your final exam, that would be our bottom weakness. Whatever the top three are and the bottom three, those are the strengths and weaknesses. So we're going to go a little bit more in depth about what were our top three and our bottom three weaknesses. Our top strength again this year was supervision. We had a 397 in our supervision score. As a college, we're still going to be monitoring this one closely this year because that 397 actually is a score that went down a little bit from last year. We want to be going up at all times because we're perfectionist and we're always striving to be improving as a college. What our employees specifically told us in our supervision category is that they need clear information about their roles and responsibilities. So we're going to take that data from our employees and we're specifically going to go out to our supervisors this year with that feedback and ask them to help be clear to their employees about what are their job responsibilities. And then we're going to go to our employees and say your voices were heard as part of this survey. But we're going to have the supervisors come back to us and show us how they clarified with their employees their roles and responsibilities across the college so that we can have that feedback loop that is so important to our employees across the college at all levels of the organization. In addition, we have invested in two programs for our supervisors. The first is related to the four disciplines of execution and the second to the five dis dysfunctions of a team. We are making supervisors all across the college participate in these programs in order to strengthen their supervisory skills. And we will be tracking and monitoring the results of that throughout the next year. We are also having several supervisors in specific functions. So if they are in a Salesforce area and they need strengthening in that particular skill set, they will be participating in targeted training related to supervisory skills in the Salesforce area. Human resources supervisors are getting greater training on what it means to be a human resources supervisor so that they have more targeted skill sets that help their employees. And that is more of our strategy um, to hopefully deliver more specific results to the college this year. The second weakness, or excuse me, strength for this year was workplace. This construct measures our employees' sense of how well our physical surroundings are maintained and how safe we are at work. Additionally, it measures if we have adequate resources to do our job. This is an area that we really need to commend our police departments and our physical plants because they're largely responsible for how our employees rate us on this particular category. And we've done very well in both years' results in this category and construct. The third strength that we had this year is work group. You can think of work group as the micro sense of how well we all get along with each other. Do we have enough trust in one another in order to get the job done that the college needs us to do? And this is another area when we've been doing very well when our employees give us feedback. 
We need to continue to enhance the feedback that we've received from our employees and let them strengthen what they already say is a positive within their departments because this is something that they're saying we feel like we're getting right. Likewise, we have three areas of weakness. The first one that is noted is employee development. In our strategic plan, we had developed employee development as one of our wildly important goals. We'd already noted we have a weakness in this area. We've got to do better at training our employees. What this specific survey calls out for us is a couple of specific items on feedback from our employees. And we're going to use this feedback in our strategic plan to deepen what we had in our wildly important goal. Based on the survey results, the employee have told us we most need to help them with what is their specific career path at TSTC. They're not as clear on that as they want to be. And that's an area that we're going to take to our employees throughout the next year. Additionally, they don't perceive a strong connection between the training that we're offering them right now and their specific job roles. They want us to get better at that when we're offering them training. So it's an opportunity that we have in the next 12 months. The next area of weakness that the survey has identified for us was an area of weakness that we had last year, which is internal communication. Industry-wide, this is one of the hardest measures that companies have to improve, and it's going to be a challenge for TSTC. It's not one of the areas that you can do it once and put it on a shelf and be done with it. You have to do it over and over again both at the individual and departmental levels and across the college. Since the last year and this last year's survey, we created the Executive Management Council, the Management Council, um, and something called in the loop sessions to increase communication with our employees and try and get information at 10 campuses and a state the size of Texas um, out to all of our employees. We still have room for improvement. We are in the process right now of hiring a lead for strategic internal communication to help improve what we are taking to our employees on a daily basis. These are efforts in addition to what we have on our portal, in departmental meetings, uh, electronic communications, one TSTC messages, things come from the office of the CEO, and what each one of us as a supervisor is responsible for doing on a daily basis to communicate to our employees. But again, it's something that you can't just do once. You can't do once a week. You've got to commit to doing it every single day and doing it at the same level of rigor um, in order for it to take effect and to have a significant measure. The final weakness that our employees have identified is pay. This is actually probably the most interesting category uh, that came across in the survey, and not just because I'm in the human resources area. Um, in our lowest scoring construct, we actually saw our strongest improvement. So even though our score is at a 255, which is not a great score, we saw significant improvement. And in fact, industry-wide improvement that is not typical for this particular category. Our employees' agreement that their pay keeps pace with the cost of living went up four points since we administered the survey in 2016. There was significant improvement in the perception of competitiveness with similar jobs in the community. This question went up 13 points from the last time we administered the survey. Employees' agreement that they are paid fairly for the work that they do increased five points from the last time that we asked them that question. This is a result of more than $2 million in investment in strategic compensation and a much more strategic plan in terms of how we are compensating our employees. But it doesn't mean that our work is nearly done in this area. This is a category that, as we look across education, as we look across all industries that are measured, it's going to be the hardest needle for us to move as an organization. We have another $2 million 
that our administration has put forward in a compensation pool for us to invest this year, and we are already making some of those strategic investments in our employees in order to help with this category. Um, I will give you a much deeper presentation at the February board meeting on strategic compensation, so we won't go much deeper than that right now. In the employee engagement survey, the other type of information that we receive is on climate. And there's lots of different climate information that is provided to us as a firm in this particular survey. There's things about our culture that we find out. There's things about how they trust upper management. Do our employees feel harassed in the workplace? How do they perceive the overall ethics of the firm? And those sorts of questions are measured in this particular survey. One of the things for us to take away from this year's result is we have room to improve in terms of how our employees perceive upper management's communication to them and whether or not they think we are effectively communicating on a consistent basis um, with them and hearing them in moments. I'm gonna go back to my comment a few minutes ago that communication with our employees is not something that you can do once and put away on a shelf. And so this is something that we have to persistently work at every day. And when our employees are answering this particular question, we aren't sure what part of upper management they are referencing. It could be for a custodian, the uh, executive director of the physical plant. It could be Ray Freed. It could be the associate vice chancellor of human resources they're thinking of. Um, there's lots of levels of management throughout an organization. But all of us in any supervisory role have to look at this particular metric and endeavor to do better on this particular score. The additional thing that we can take away from here is that we've got an opportunity in any moment we are in front of our employees to help communicate to them the ways we have used their feedback to actually make improvements in the college. So I'll go back to one of my comments that I've made before this board before. We took feedback from our employees in last year's survey and we changed our compensation strategy. We will make changes to this year's compensation strategy based on our 2017 results. I met with Gail Lawrence just a couple of days ago to start talking with her about ways to unpack the results of this survey and apply it to compensation strategy right now. We don't do a good enough job always as management in letting our employees know how we are using their data. Our strategic plan is thoroughly connected to the voices of our employees in the survey of employee engagement. But when we are in front of our employees, we have to connect those dots in order for them to understand how we are listening to their voices and that their voices matter to us in management. And if I carry no other message across to other members of management this year, that will be my message. 74% of our employees spoke to us and we have an opportunity to make sure that they know that we heard them. The next thing that is really important for you to know as a board that is going to happen next with these results is each of our 10 locations are going to have meetings with employee groups. Our provosts are going to help facilitate that at the campuses along with other strategic members of management. And we're going to be meeting at other functional groups, unpacking the results of these surveys and giving our employees opportunities to ask questions, to dialogue with us, um, and to take the specific results that we have seen in this survey and go back and improve on strengths and weaknesses that we see as a college. That is one of the many ways that they can feel empowered that we're actually doing something with the data that they have provided to us and the voices that they presented to us as a management team. One of the next things that I think is important for you to know about the climate 
uh, results in this survey is that we had relatively low reports of either harassment or ethical violations by our employees in this survey. While there is still some percentage that reported that in the survey for a company our size, these are good numbers for our industry. We always want to drive those numbers lower but they aren't numbers to be concerned about as a board. Um, and when we do find those numbers, what we're pleased about is people are comfortable reporting them, they're comfortable making reports to human resources, and we are able to deal with those effectively and efficiently when people are able to come forward. What are gonna be our next steps from here? Every employee is gonna know the results of this survey, including the open comments that have been made as part of the survey. Um, we're not going to have any lack of transparency about what was in the survey. They will be in the portal, they'll be communicated um, through our provost groups, they'll be um, in other sorts of electronic formats so that they're part of the public record. We will improve on our areas of strength and we will also look at our areas of weaknesses. Our functional areas as well as our locations will have the opportunity to respond to the specific results that are in this survey and our strategic planning cycle will integrate what we saw here throughout the next 12 months. And then we're gonna repeat the survey. So this will be an ongoing benchmark that the college has every 12 months so that we see progressive progress as the years go on. If you have any questions for me at this time, I would be open to those and happy to take those. Yes, sir. Is there a breakdown between the campuses, you know, kind of get a, a, a fair view of whether it was Waco, Harlingen, or whatever? Uh, it's a great question. Um, some of our locations we had 98% percentage uh, completion at. Um, some of our locations, our metrics were close to 70% at our large locations. Um, one of the fabulous things that came out of this particular year's survey and why we had 74% is our locations competed pretty well with each other to have a high participation rate. Um, and when our sister campuses get competitive with each other, um, they tend to get really great results. Um, our small locations uh, were all over 80% in their participation. Um, our two largest locations, um, they have a little room for improvement. I'm going to throw the gauntlet down to Rick Herrera and Adam Hutchinson, but their numbers compared to the year before were A, uh, they still get A's on their report cards for how they did. Um, we were extremely pleased with how our faculty and staff students leaned in with us this year and helped us get greater participation in those areas. Um, we really could not have been more pleased with how uh, our functions and our departments and our locations cooperated. From an internal communication strategy, this was actually something that went really well this year um, and one of the first times that something statewide became viral and people helped us get the word out all across the state. Um, Hannah, in, uh, in the light of transparency, would you see that all the board members get a copy of Absolutely. the summary report? And secondly, how long have we been searching for a uh, director of communications? I mean, it seems like it's been a long time. And uh, what, if, if there is a problem, what is it? Why can't we get somebody on board here? Yes. We were delayed. Um, up a while during the hiring freeze. So we've started in earnest since 9-1. Um, the chancellor um, held himself to the same hiring freeze that um, all of the other component parts of the college were. Um, and he could have potentially gone to local funding, but he made a management decision that while his other areas were suffering, um, and not able to hire positions. He did not go to local funding for that particular position. 
Um, we are at this moment still seeking candidates. Our first wave of um, candidates that we got in, we were not as thrilled with the applicant pool as we wanted to be. So we have done a few more things to get additional candidates into that pool. Um, but we are hopeful that we're going to have that candidate placed with a short period of time. But that's the, the full answer for you. Is 9-1 is when we started researching for all staff. Yeah, it sounds like the sooner the better. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, anything else for Hannah? Thank you, Hannah, for a Thank very you. good report. I appreciate that. Very useful. All right, uh, any other unfinished business? Hearing none, uh, we'll move on to new business. Anybody have any new business to bring up? All right, public comments. Uh, procedures for public comment at TSTC board meetings are governed by Texas statute and the bylaws of the Board of Regents of the Texas State Technical College System, section 551.042 of the Texas Open Meetings Act restricts the TSTC Board of Regents from dialogue in response to public comments. Are there any public comments? Nobody. Okay. All right, at this time, uh, if the public would remain seated, please. The meeting, uh, this meeting of the TSTC Board of Regents held at Texas State Technical College Connolly Meeting and Conference Center of Waco, Texas on Thursday, November 16, 2017. After proper posting and in accordance with Chapter 551 of the Texas Government Code of the specific purpose provided in Sections 551.071, 551.072, and 551.074, will recess from open meeting into closed meeting. At this time, the Board will follow a procedure we did last meeting in conducting the closed meeting. The public may remain here in the Austin room while the regents retire to the adjoining Crockett room uh, to conduct the closed meeting. When the closed meeting is concluded, the board will return here to reconvene an open meeting. The current time is 3.50 p.m. So we now uh, recess this meeting into closed session for the regents, and I think the Crockett room is right there. All right. Okay. <clears throat> Mic test, mic test, 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 test.
It's uh, 4.12 p.m. Uh, there is no action from the closed session discussions. Uh, next item on the agenda is election of officers and uh, call on the general counsel to present the slate of officers for 2018. The slate of nominated officers for the ensuing year presented by the regents is uh, John Hatchell has been nominated for chair, uh, Ivan Andarza for vice chair, Regent Skinner and Regent Hearn as executive committee members. That's a sl slate y'all have suggested. You can certainly discuss that or alter it if that's, your, if that's to your liking. Okay. Any questions about that? Everybody here who the nominations were? Uh, I'll accept a motion for approval of those nominations. Okay. Motion by Regent Cleveland. Second, Second by Regent Mead. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. Hearing none, motion carries. Congratulations, Regent Thank Chairman Hatchell. Much. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Vice Chairman Ann Dardley, congratulations. All right. Mr. Skinner. All right. Um, Mr. Chancellor, your comments, sir. Uh, I'd like to point out that our meetings, our meetings for next year are the final page in your board book. Uh, I believe we've also sent those to you electronically so you can mark your calendar. Um, and the board, I'll also say the board has the authority to call meetings at any time in addition to the regular quarterly meetings. Uh, and, but those are the ones we'll calendar for the coming year. And then I'd like to say once again, thank you very much to uh, the TSTC Foundation for the generous uh, uh, support that they gave us in the meetings today. And most especially, uh, with your permission, I will extend your appreciation to the culinary arts faculty, many of whom were the people who cooked your supper last night. And, um, and I have to say that might have been the best we've had. And so with your permission, I will Absolutely. extend your gratitude. Absolutely. Is that it? Mr. Chancellor. Okay, very good. Any other comments from the board? Anybody? Well, just let me say thank you as well. Uh, Mike, thanks to you. Thanks to all the staff for another great meeting. I think it was very informational and uh, good, good session for hopefully the new regents to begin to get up, up to speed and we'll look for, I know Chairman Hatchell will look for more good things to come in that, in that vein. Thanks to the foundation for, again, for all your work, and uh, I couldn't agree more about the, uh, the food service this time. It was just excellent. So hearing nothing else, uh, this meeting is adjourned at 4.14 uh, p.m. Thank you.